What's up, my friends? Welcome back to Short Story Long. This week, we are sitting down with Maurice Claret. If you're not familiar with Maurice's story, you're about to be pleasantly, pleasantly surprised. Um, he did a 30 for 30 on ESPN because his story is that incredible. And to be honest, I didn't even really know um, hardly any of the details until he came in and ran me through it and talked about it. And it is mind-blowing. He grew up in Ohio, had a very, very, very promising uh, football career, and went through some ups and downs. And I'll let him tell you, because I don't want to spoil it. So that's it. Uh, I hope you guys like it. If you do, make sure you give me a like, make sure you subscribe, and leave me a comment below. I'm going to be uh, responding to comments. Thank you guys. I hope you enjoy. The hardest part is figuring out what you want to master. Focus on your product. Can you tell somebody that they suck? You gotta just go for This it. is exactly what I wanna do for a living. You can't even tell somebody that their breath is fit for life. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Short Story Long. We are here with a very special guest, uh, my fellow Ohioan, yeah. <laughs> uh, Maurice Claret. Man, I'm really excited uh, about this, and I can't wait to just sort of hear your story. And like, you know, you're a podcast pro. You're, uh, you know, we were connected by uh, Corey and John from mm -hmm. uh, from their podcast, and and they came on here and crushed it. There you uh, go. They did a good job. And I always say like. I love when I have guests that have been on podcasts or done this sort of stuff mm -hmm. because it's just a night and day difference of like knowing kind of how this stuff goes and yes. how to flow. And, you know, sometimes I'll have guests that are great guests and have have a good story to tell, but maybe they haven't told it a, a bunch of times or whatever. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you have trouble. I'm not necessarily the most skilled interviewer in the world. And so I'm sitting here trying to like figure out how to do it. But you're a pro, so you'll know uh, exactly how to do this. Gotcha. Absolutely. Um well, not one. I'll say thank you for uh, having me on. Uh, I really um, prior to prior to this, when I was uh, speaking to Daniel, uh, I just firmly believe that stories uh, help to impact people in in, in the greatest way. Yeah. And uh, when he talked to me about how you originated the podcast, and you just talked about you know the fact that you have so many different meetings that other people wouldn't be exposed to normally, yep. uh, or just conversations that you know the average person wouldn't come through. And then when he made the connection with Ohio, a lot of my stuff stems from that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Uh, coming from Youngstown, especially uh, being in like a small space, knowing that, you know, information isn't readily accessible like other people. Yeah. Opportunity isn't re readily accessible in your life of some sorts can be a lightning rod of inspiration. But also, uh, I think that uh, just I just believe stories change my life. You know yep. what I mean? So hopefully just through the course of living my life, I continue to tell stories or provide stories or impact people in some uh in some positive way yeah it's so important man and that's why i mean yeah the reason why i started this is i noticed how important it was i mean i learned so much just from talking to people and just mm -hmm. from hearing people's stories and hearing you know the good and bad and what worked and what didn't and like and being able to apply that but i mean i think as you grow through life and through any whatever industry you're in or whatever you kind of have to like almost earn your way to hearing those stories if that makes any sense yes i never heard that way but yes <laughs> yeah and it's like you know i kind of wanted to eliminate some of that you know because i noticed like man this is i just learned from hearing and like there's not any kids or young people shouldn't have to fight or make it through all of these hoops and all this stuff just to hear someone's story and relate mm -hmm. to it and hear what was good and what was bad i mean that information should be very very accessible and so that was my goal is like how can i use my relationships and my time in this industry and all the stuff that I've done to give those conversations to other people. And what I didn't realize is, sure, that sounds great and that sounds like I'm a real hero, but it's so, I've learned so much from forcing myself to sit down once a week with an interesting person and me learn from them. You know what I mean? Yeah, just, just digest it and getting, totally understand. Yeah, like that's why I would, I would even tell like, if, if young people ask me now like for advice, one of the biggest things I would say is schedule a, a one day a week in your calendar where you have two hours and go get coffee with someone that you look up to on any level. If it's a family member, even if you're like, if you're in Youngstown, Ohio, maybe mm -hmm. you have an uncle that is working a cool job, whatever, because mm -hmm. the amount that I have learned just from forcing myself through that exercise is so good. So anyway, I personally, and I'm sure the entire audience can't thank you enough for coming on and just giving it to us, you know? Yeah, well, th well thanks for having me. Well, I'll tell you what that, and I have a habit, oftentimes uh, a little inconsistent, but uh, just the way that you uh, sit down and, and talk to people, I personally uh, buy books every week. Yep. And so what I found out, and this just can go for anybody, 
I found out that oftentimes the people aren't readily readily accessible or just won't have the time. Yep. And uh, when I was in prison, I was like, man, you know, for 20 or 30 bucks or even $50, um, you've allowed, or a person has allowed you in their space or in their mind for $50. You yep. know what I'm saying? And so uh, I'll take a book. And and, I, and, uh, and, and one of the things, like I, when I, I used to get up in, in prison, obviously, I, w- I would be locked down for so long that you had the time to just sit and read and digest and take notes and, 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 and consume the information totally different. Yep. But when they got uh, when I got out here to audio books and I started realizing that you can learn on the run yeah, and you can go from A to B and you can constantly do it. I was like, man, so you're telling me I can go pick out a person and grab a, and grab them and just have a complete conversation. And this is something that, you know, when people prepare books, they prepare for months at a time. You yep. know, people edit and and they're, uh, you know, going through the language and how stuff is framed up. And I just think for anybody who's just looking to learn or get out this situation that a, a small investment you know, uh, be it if you, if you don't have the people or have the time to get in front of people, another option is um, another option. I believe is buying books or buying audio books. So I think those things help me tremendously. Yeah, and even what you're doing on the podcast front, yeah. like it's amazing uh-huh. what podcasts have done for that. You yes. know what I mean? And one of the things that I wrote down, and you know, it's kind of like an affirmation I tell myself every day is I'm aware of the content that I consume, and I only take in positive and uplifting messages. And mm-hmm. one thing that I think is so crazy about that I've just experienced with my life is when you go down the things tend to like snowball, right? Either either positive or negative. Mm-hmm. So it tends that like, you know, if you're going to the gym, you're working out, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're eating better. These things kind of snowball upwards or vice versa, right? Yes. Um, and so <laughs> what I've noticed is um, if I'm listening to a podcast I really like, maybe they mention a book and then I go mm-hmm. grab that book and then maybe in that book it, it tells me a better way to do this and then that and then that. Mm-hmm. And so I just, from just being aware of not going home. I mean, there was three years ago, there was a phase where I would go home every night and I would turn on literally either CNN or lock up uh, on NBC, right? I know where it's going. <laughs> and, I, yeah, and I don't know why, but that's just what I would do. And I wasn't paying attention. And then I would make food and I'd be watching lock up and like, you know, like I swear I'm like an expert in, in prison now, but like I watch hours and hours and hours of lock up. And what you don't realize is like, you're you're watching a lot of negative information, yes. right? Like, you know, sure, there's stuff to learn from that, but like, man, you're just taking on hours and hours. And sure, by the time you're done eating your dinner and whatever, and now it's 7, 8 p.m. and you've just watched an hour of prison, you know, you're not feeling very motivated to <laughs> hit the gym or whatever. No, I mean, you can watch, I mean, and, and, and this is not bashing any, any news station, so I won't say a news station, but yeah. the news, uh, the news tends to, show you the, the the negative narrative of, of america of everything <laughs> you know oh, what i'm saying man and, and, and i'm laughing because uh, uh i'm laughing because i remember um I, w- I was at a, i was i was i was at an event and it was some uh man who used to play football back in the day and he was like man you know why i don't turn on the news because it's negative 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 yeah. he, he turned to the next news station is negative 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 and, and and I don't know lock up and I don't know the producers and I know your platform is a lot bigger than mine so I don't want somebody to take something out of context. No, no, I don't go for uh, it. But but even lock up, that's not the complete prison narrative. You yes. know what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, that that's the um, that's you, you, like like just like with ESPN, you watch ESPN, you have the dunks and, and all that stuff. Yeah, that, that's the stuff that it's keeps the, the prison viewer. highlight yeah. reel. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the prison highlight reel. So for the for those who may have family members who are incarcerated. You know, beating guys up all day and 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 guys, you know, fighting with police officers all day. There, there is that element of it. Yep. But that's not the whole prison narrative. And, I, and so I, I do have to say that in defense of guys who may be coming into into society, and, and a person like, man, I watch Lock Up. Is this yeah. guy like the guys from Lock Up? Yeah, it's so true, right? You think all of a sudden now, like, oh, you went to prison? I, I know you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's funny, but yeah, no, I just realized that that's such an important thing, and if you can. Simply train, you know what else is like, it's kind of like eating better, right? Which I'm not an expert at, but what I can say is if you're eating better for a week and let's say Mm -hmm. you cut out fast food or something, when you go to McDonald's, you feel it twice as hard, Yes, you know? And so as opposed to if you eat McDonald's the whole week, you don't even notice when you have that double, double. So the same way that if you have a week or a month of positive, inspiring, educating content, and then you watch something negative, you feel it like, ooh, like that, well, I didn't I, need that. I, I'll tell you like this, uh, one thing that I, that I think it was hard, like, so I believe working out is tremendously hard for people. Yeah. I believe the information that you consume with your eyes and ears is tremendously hard. And I also believe food, I think those th- three things wrapped up. 
uh, are the like the the things to help you self govern yourself better. Yep. And one of the biggest hurdles that not completely, uh, but one of the biggest hurdles I think that I've overcome was just eliminating music. And so I got a small playlist uh, of only like praise and worship or encouraging music, or even if I pick rap, yep. uh, or or any any genre of music, I'm very conscious of like, okay, what does this dude speak in? Uh, how does the beat make me feel? And what spirit do I believe to put? Like, I'll get down to the point when I'm consuming music. Like, what spirit did the producer make this music in? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I, I've never done music, but I'm pretty sure uh, just through the process of creation, somebody's coming and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm putting this energy into this music to Absolutely. make somebody feel this way. Yep. And so I'll literally uh, streamline a, a my, my, my music catalog. Now, even though I love that other stuff and, and, and my uh, my ego wants to gravitate to it because it, it puts me in a mode to where like I'm just feeling like you know something different. Yep. Um, but I, I 100% believe you. But when I start off with that, like so when I'm up early, I'm up at 4:45. Even out here, you know, I came out here and I'm still up at 4:45, 5 Jesus. in the morning. Yep. Uh, I'm working out. I'm getting my body going into a positive motion. I'm running. I'm lifting. I'm listening to the praise and worship music. My spirit in the right direction. And so by the time I either you know come back into the house from gym or come back into uh, my home. Uh, every time, like I'm just in, a, I'm in, a, I'm in a good mood. Yep. My spirit's high, my, and I don't care what anybody says. When you carry that spirit to each meeting, like I can almost play all of my meetings through in my head. Like I already know what a guy's gonna say. I know, uh, like from the from the initial point of when I walk into somebody, hey, how you doing? The spirit of encouragement. I believe, I believe, as as human beings, you have the the ability to harness that energy, yep. you know, and then you can transfer that energy. And it projects a, a, a certain internal feeling to to um, the individual you're connecting with. Yep. And 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 so in in the same vein that you're talking, like I heard you loud and clear, uh, that being able to set that pace, set that tempo, set that energy, set that mentality, create the spirit of encouragement and positivity, your whole day rolls like that. And when you're not in that space, I definitely believe that if you, if you don't catch yourself and you pick your energy up, your personal energy with music with uh, the food you consume and all that stuff, I believe that your day goes into that direction. So being conscious and attuned to that, I, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah, it's just amazing to me. I think a huge hurdle for me was like realizing that that is in your control. Mm -hmm. You know, because you kind of yes. just, I think most people go throughout the day and you listen to whatever hot songs on the radio, you watch whatever hot TV shows on TV, you watch the news and you just sort of, I don't know, you don't even consider how that might be making you feel or what sort of perspective all that is being told from or whatever, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I think just realizing that was a huge thing. So that's why I'm trying to master this and try to uh, uh, contribute to the positive content. Mm -hmm. And also I'm very grateful for what you guys do because you guys do a great job doing it as well. Yeah, and and we just and, and for what business and biceps, we just speak from two different platforms. I think it's, it's um, and it's very... Um, the, the the focal point is always just to keep it pure. Yeah. Right. Because uh, I I've, I've been reading lately uh, a course in miracles and it says uh, uh, after the first chapter says nothing real can be threatened nothing unreal exists it, therein lies a piece of there here lies a piece of God. Yeah. And trying to as you're delivering content or delivering information to people to make it as real as possible so it connects. I remember I was watching. Um, Denzel Washington, he was on a, what is his name? A Charlie Rose. Yep. They were there on a Charlie Rose show. And um, he was asking Denzel about, you know, his whole career and everything he had been through. Um, but he is like, you know, like, you know, everybody comes to Hollywood. Everybody comes out here with dreams and, and, and a massive amounts of ambition to want to be successful. He is like, you know, what differentiates you from anybody else? And he is like, man, one thing I understood uh, was from the specific comes the universal. And he was just talking about if I can stay true and in tune to myself and if I can lean on specific emotions that I go through, he said, I understand that that transcends color, it understands class, uh, culture, uh, upbringing, everything that a person person can connect to that. Yep. And he said, I don't have to act like a character. I can just get in tune to myself. And so I was in prison watching this. And yep. as he said it, I was like, yo, like that's like the essence of life. You know, like that's like the essence of taking control of yourself. That's like the essence of how you connect to people. That's the essence of being in tune with yourself. Yeah. And when he had said that, I was like, yo, you know, I think, um, you know, how, like you ever, you ever get information at moments of time in your life, like, you know, the hell with all the brands and stuff like that, like yeah. all the all the stuff that you do from like a career standpoint. Yeah. But it's just different moments in time where you grab information 
and it just makes it feel like you have both of your hands on your steering wheel. Absolutely. And I, I don't know how to describe it any other way than... It's just when the, it's almost like the quote, uh, like when the student is ready, the teacher arrives, right? It's almost like mm -hmm. when the right teacher hits the right moment in your life, you feel that connection. Like you yes. just feel like, woo, that was the piece of information I needed at this very moment. No, no, I, I, 100%. I, I agree with that. But I also think that um, there's a shift, even when I hear you talking, like there's a shift where I think you search for development because at some point you understand that. Everything that you have is inside you. Yep. If you don't come from, yep. like it's not like um, it, it, it's almost like it, it's like the um, so me and my lady we've been been together thirteen years. This is pr prior to prison and post prison, right? Yeah. And from the outside looking in, a person would say, okay, if a woman gets with a man when he's in the NFL, she's only with him for yep. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, materialistic things, right? Yeah. And as those things faded and went away, and we went from. Uh, living how you want to basically you have to uh, live off a of bare minimum in, in an unfortunate circumstance you start to realize that the connection is there deeper yep. it, there's for a personal connection but I think that when it comes to career and life and, and and development I think that you go from a place where you you're you're realizing that external things don't make me it's like the guy who Drives around LA and all of the Ferraris, like you know the old doctor oh, sure. guys. You know what yeah, I'm yeah, that's what this city's yeah, built yeah. on. <laughs> you know, like the, the guys, you know, it, 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 no offense to that or them, but the external stuff creates the environment, and the environment is fake, and everybody knows it, but they celebrate it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But I think that when you when you have the the flip side of that, when you realize that the success is inside of you. And you're almost talking about you said it earlier, and I know we I know we got so far off path, but I, I, I'm no, enjoying yeah. the conversation, but. Yeah. When you said that the uh, what is it called that the um, oh, man you said it. I, like this, I, lost, I lost my train of thought, but That's okay. but, but, the, but the but the point of what I was talking about was that uh, when, it, it's just me realizing that everything that you have is inside of you. Nothing external yes, makes you that, and I said, and when you're talking about getting the right to have these conversations, those are just all de things that develop you, and they're developing you internally and developing your yes. perspective and yes. your, all that stuff. So agreed. We're on the same page, man. What an opener. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to start this thing. Um, okay, so let's do what I usually do here. And like I said, we're both Ohioans. You're from Youngstown? Youngstown, yes. That's cool. You're not from Akron. Yes, that's so what we're told real close. Yeah. Very close. Yeah. Very close. Um, so that's where you were born and raised? Born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio. Got it. And so what was, I mean, I can kind of relate. How old are you? Uh, 34. Got it. So I'm 31. So our, our childhoods weren't that, you know, yeah, same that era. far off. Yeah, same. Yeah. Um, what was childhood like for you? Uh, well, childhood, I mean, well, you, it's, it's easy for you to understand, but childhood, and so you can remember Youngstown in the 90s era. Yeah. And so for the, for, the, for the common viewer who doesn't know it, you can almost call it sort of a miniature uh, L.A. or a miniature Chicago. Uh, for the most part, Youngstown, um, in, in that space upon my childhood, was known as like a gangster town, yeah. uh, either with organized crime or just with gangs. I think gangs at the... Uh, the entire country hard around then, or, or yep. everybody projecting that, you know, the, the, the tough guy machismo. It's so true. I know? remember. I remember even in Akron where, like, there isn't, I mean, I don't want to say that there's not gangs in Akron. I apologize, Akron. But I'm saying Coventry, where I yes. was from, there's not legitimate gangs, right? But everyone, even even there, it's almost like the 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 kids who maybe were getting into trouble or whatever were calling themselves Bloods or Crips or yes. whatever just because it started to really blow up and become popular. Yes. And so there were kids walking around my school with blue rags and stuff like that, but like there weren't Crips in Coventry, <laughs> Ohio, you know what I'm saying? But it just became like a thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same thing. So what is it? Uh, art imitating life or whatever, yes. whatever, whatever I begin to see on TV. You, you, you go back to colors you go back to juice you go back to boys in the hood yep. uh hip-hop in general had a large uh influence in general just on america and when i speak when you think about childhood all that stuff was like displayed and down in youngstown and uh for, for the most part man you know for the first part of my childhood I grew up with my grand well mother worked but grew up in the, with my grandmother uh with most of our cousins probably you know 12 13 14 15 of us uh were pretty much like any kid like um in, in now I'm speaking from a perspective of like that childhood was crazy, but going through it, it seemed like very normal. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Crime seems normal. Uh, and you don't even you don't even categorize it as something like, oh, there's crime going on. I got to get out of here. You're just like, oh, this is what's going on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? 
And um, and, but for the times really I can remember is like um, when I started to uh, you know get into football, start playing football uh, back in '88. You know, I was five years old playing, you know, playing uh, organized football, and you know, go through the years, uh, you know, projecting this uh, this little tough guy uh, mentality, all for the purpose of being the leader of my little homeboys. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying started off, you know, breaking the houses, stealing cars. Uh, but the first real uh, uh, problem I had was that I, I stole a car on the 4th of July. And through the process of uh, stealing the car, we go on this big high-speed chase with the police officers. Uh, I ended up running. Uh, make a long story short, I ended up getting caught. And as I was caught, uh, I went down to the juvenile hall for like three days. And after I get out to the juvenile hall for about three days, I come back to my neighborhood. And, you know, as I'm coming through the neighborhood and, and guys realize when I got out, my mother goes to work. Uh, you know, all my all my buddies, uh, either in the neighborhood or in school, they're like, "Yo, you went to the uh, to uh, the detention center." You know, uh, you know how was it? What was the intake process like? And there was a sense of um, like of accomplishment, yep. as if I had done something that you know I went to the place where no man has ever went before. How and, old were you at that point? Uh, that was like I was eleven. Jesus. You know, I'm like eleven years old, and yep. so just think, my, my daughter's eleven right here, yep. and, and and just to think, like I couldn't imagine her being in a. Uh, a correctional facility for youth, you know what I mean? And from there, uh, my mother, I, I just remember this time, like my mother had seen both of my older brothers go through it. How much and, older were your older brother? Uh, my middle brother is two years older than me. My oldest brother is three years older than me. Got it. So a couple questions real quick. Like, did your, when you said there was like 13 or 14, was that all in one house or one yeah, like uh, area? No, or? so um, so all of our mothers worked during the day. Mothers and, uh, mothers and fathers worked during the day. Yep. And so when the kids would go to school, they would just come back to the grandmother's house after Got school. It. Got it. And so the mother would be gone for the majority of the day. Got it. And then, like, did you get into football? What what age when you first started playing football? Well, I started playing football at five. And so uh, the legit story is that no, there was nothing else to do. Yep. You know, so just take into the context. You know, this is you know this is obviously 2018. You have you know youth camps everywhere and basketball camps and everything like that. Like at that time, it was just only youth football and. Any kid who was eligible or could play, that was the deal. It was yeah. either that or whatever the uh, the Salvation Army had organized. So the Salvation Army would open up the gym for the kids in the neighborhood to come play basketball and you know you, you know that that sort of sort of stuff. Yeah, and so it wasn't even that necessarily you had this crazy passion for football. No, it was just the thing no, to do. it's either you play in the front yard or uh, at that time I, I thought it was cool. I remember my cousin would play high school football. So seeing him, you know, as a kid, you're like, oh, pads, helmet, pants, you know what I'm yeah, saying? It just looks cool. Yeah, it just looks cool. Oh, that's man, it. It's so funny, man. I remember I signed up for football and I didn't make it through that first, like, hell week or whatever. But <laughs> damn it, when I came home with my pads, I was like, yes. Yeah, I made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's so true. <laughs> um, so I, uh, okay, so then when you were younger, did you notice, like, let's say from five, we'll say until 11, were were your family members and cousins and that stuff getting in trouble also? Like, was that just always something that was so common? Yeah, I mean, um, you, you take my older cousin, uh, my older cousin, Chad, and, uh, you know, he had been through the juvenile system and Antoine and Andre and Junebug and Jermaine. And so guys just going to uh, the detention center was normal. Yep. You know, and, and, and really you have no context to distinguish, like, there's anything different. And, and as a kid, you don't even have that level of awareness. Like, oh, my cousin's getting in trouble. I'm not supposed to be in trouble. You're just looking at, like, and just, you're just looking at it as this is how things go. Yeah. This is how things unfold. And so you don't have, you know, you don't even have context for it. Yeah, it's so interesting, man. Uh, it's something that as I get older and gain a better perspective, like, understanding how powerful it is just what young people think their destiny is. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, just not realizing. We talk about breaking out of the habit of, like, what type of content you consume. But, I mean, on a bigger level, it's, like, literally sort of just following a path. And you just, you, like you said, you don't look at crime as even crime. You look at it as normal. And you yeah. look at it as, yes. like, almost like the normal world being foreign, you know? Yeah, I mean, but you, but, uh, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, yeah, but you yeah. see how as you get older and your thinking is not consistent with how the world acts, yeah. Uh, you you start to you start to realize that you program yourself wrong, and this this is for L.A. kids, Chicago kids, uh, kids in New York, and kids in every major and, and minor city. Oftentimes, uh, what I, what I've come to find out just through my travels, um, that rural America and urban America suffer from the same thing because the mentality is built all on survival. Mm -hmm. Like 
um, it's literally how do I survive given the conditions that I'm in? Mm-hmm. And then oftentimes when it's time to graduate and erase that entire mentality and get into quote unquote regular America or corporate America or where the circumstances are normal mm-hmm. uh, based upon how America was built or the intention of how it was built, that's where the confusion comes because there's so many habits that are built up that aren't consistent with being just a self-sustaining, responsible adult. And that's not in every case, but in a lot of cases with my story and with yeah. my friends, yeah. um, I, can, I can just speak from my perspective. So I don't want people to take it out of context. No, and I and once again, like we're going super big picture down the road here, but like the thing that I am fascinated by is I think like what you're talking about with where you came from is an extreme example of that. But I think that exists in almost everyone. Like I think there are people with behavioral wiring things that may take away from them living their best life. Yes. Right? Even if it's minor, you don't realize that that one thing of how your dad treated a situation or how your you know, parents had crazy anxiety or how, you know, like you don't mm-hmm. realize that those things are your normal. And so when you get into the real world, these are things that are causing you to go through these constant, like repetitive failures or these constant issues. And you don't realize that it's just from that. And you might even look back at your childhood and be like, my childhood was normal. I went to school. I went to college even. Everything was yes. normal. But like it, being able to audit that, I think, it, and have that like clarity and awareness mm-hmm. is like a tool that I'm just scratching the surface of trying to figure out. But I think like if we could teach that and and learn that at a younger age we'd have a lot higher like you know happiness or, or success rate you oh, know oh no i believe you 100 percent one one thing that came up when you start talking about that was that a lot of that behavior and again this is big picture i don't want to get too far away from what we're talking about but yeah. a lot of point a, a lot of stuff happens and it disrupts the entry point uh it, a lot of stuff happens and it messes up the attitude with the person and it disrupts the entry point for anybody to help them yep. for them to learn for them to engage for for so much and a lot comes just from uh producing our, our, our shitty attitude get my fault uh attitude gets produced from that yeah. that isn't congruent with um with how basically you would like for a person to live life you know or, or to to move forward in life that's all I'm yeah saying. and the worst thing unfortunately once again the way we're wired the worst thing you can do is tell a person that they are fundamentally wrong you know what I'm saying? Yes. Like you tell a young person, like, that is not true. Like, you attack their character. It's a wrap. They're not going to hear that. Man. You know, they're putting a wall up to that, and they're doubling down <laughs> on whatever their behavior was. And I notice it now. <laughs> I notice it now. Like, I, at 31 years old, running a, a business for 10 years, I notice talking to another 30-year-old about their behavior at work. You have to approach it in such a tricky way because attacking someone's character is the last thing you can do. They're going to double down on that. Uh, <laughs> you know? And that goes for... For kids in, in juvenile detention to kids at workplace, to, it's just that's a it, to me that's something I'm seeing as like a through line in life itself. It's yeah. interesting, you know. No, I put like this. I'm, I'm not going to disagree with that. <laughs> as you start talking, yeah, you know, it, like this, we have 135 employees, right? So I've seen every single thing that you're talking about now. Yeah. I've seen every. I, I, I've, I've seen how behavior can disrupt something. I'll say that. Yes, so true. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. Um, okay, so at 11, so that was the first big thing at 11. Yes. Got it. And then so just like you said, kind of being honest about it, when you came back to school, you didn't feel like I had done something ter- terribly wrong. My life is going on the wrong path. You felt like, look at me, I'm a soldier. I have this yeah. badge of honor now. Right? Yeah, I, I, I've been validated uh, amongst our... Uh, our trivial um, group of people, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not to call these guys trivial, but I'm, but, but to say what I was validating uh, was very trivial from from going to jail. So uh, I, I stay out of trouble for a little bit. Uh, the second run in or second major um, thing that happens was outside of me, you know, getting in trouble here and there and doing st- stupid stuff. The second thing was we got into a, a fist fight with some guys from at a skating ring. Mm-hmm. And so they corral all the guys up there, arrest us, and they take us down to the juvenile facility. And this time I stay a little bit longer. And uh, I get back out from that situation. At this time I'm maybe 12 or 13-ish, uh, somewhere up in there. And that's when my mother was like, okay, let me put you on um, AAU basketball. AAU basketball was just like – it was still new and fresh at the time. So, yeah. like, like, to be a part of an AAU team uh, was like a big deal. You know, or, or it was new to our area. So – I started playing basketball more, uh, got into uh, a junior high sports, seventh and eighth grade sports, my fault, 
Uh, got into junior high sports a little bit more. Uh, had some more positive influences. Uh, my junior high coach, uh, Mr. Butch, and and uh, Coach White, and, and things of that nature. But the, but the but the reality was that the uh, just the neighborhood was more important than sports. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because you know, in, in this day and age, you can pop on the internet and you can really, uh, even though it is two percent to make it, you can kind of see. <clears throat> excuse me. You can kind of see the path to a guy going yeah. professional. Yeah. You know, so you can kind of see. Okay, I don't know if I'll make it, but I know all of the things that I got to do. Uh, to make it, but we're talking about 96, 97, you know, to think that you're even going to go to college and to play major college sports, like that just wasn't even a deal. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, I didn't take sports serious. And so you fast forward that, I stayed out of trouble for a while. And then my last big thing was that uh, I broke into a gentleman's house. This is my, this is May of my eighth grade year. I break into a gentleman's house. And as I break in, uh, we had, yelled and screamed and knocked on the door and checked to see if anybody was home. But when we actually get in there, we uh, actually went into the guy's room and we were taking the uh, PlayStation out the room. It's on PlayStations that just came out. Yeah. And uh, as we were taking a PlayStation, we heard the, guy, the, the door open from down the hall. The guy walks down the hall. And as he walks down the hall, he sees us. He, uh, he takes off down the hall, runs down the steps, and he shut the door. And uh, I heard him shut the door real loud. And so my guy, uh, who I was with breaking into the house, he ran down and chased after him. Uh, but I was so scared from the moment I ran out the hallway and there's a second story window and I ran as fast as I could, just jumped out the window, just like sheer adrenaline, yep. busting my head on the window, busting my head. You know, when I got to the ground, I'm halfway dizzy. And to make a long story short, I ended up getting caught. And um, when I get caught, they uh, they take us back down to the uh, the juvenile facility. And uh, at that time, they uh, they put us inside of a dormitory and all the kids were uh, laid out on the, uh, on the floor uh, on the little mattresses, that, <clears throat> excuse me, on the mattresses that they had. And uh, from there, uh, God bless him, uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Roland Smith. He was the actual correctional officer, but he was also a high school coach. Uh -huh. And uh, he had basically grabbed me and said, hey, you know, uh, man, I see you play basketball and football. And, you know, I know your parents and, like, you're just ruining your life. Like, you can really do something with this. And so from there, I was just kind of, like, still pushing him away. Like, you know, I don't really get where you're going. But he's like, man, let me see if I can go to the judge tomorrow, see if I can place you on house arrest. And when I place you on house arrest, allow um, you to basically come back and forth to me to lift weights and condition during the summer so you can come to my high school and play football. And uh, to make a long story short, the judge agreed to it. They placed me on house arrest and basically start, you know, working uh, working out when you get ready to go to high school. Wow. What a moment. Yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> like, holy cow. Were you, yeah. were you good? Like, did he do that also because you were just naturally super talented and he saw how good you could potentially be, do you think? Yeah, I, I think it is. And this is the, this is the case in uh, in most inner city circumstances. And I see that you, you may have um, adults in some capacity. They may just see that sports is, from their perspective, your best way to get out. Yep. And so outside of everything else, let, it, let us just give you the chance. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, let us uh, do everything we can to save you, to derail, not derail you, to, to guard you, safeguard you from trouble. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was in the spirit of that. Like, you know, it, it, just imagine if you're a correctional officer from his perspective, you see so many guys come in and out and just waste their lives. Yeah. And, and a lot of these guys may not have talent. They just, yeah. guys, they just may be guys just coming in and out, in and out. And so you finally get a chance to touch one. Man, look, you know what? You're right here. You can do better than this. Yeah. Or, or maybe you just need some, need some male mentorship, you know what I'm saying? Or maybe you just need uh, a father. So you, you think just if, if you can probably statistically go, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I would, I would wage anything that I have uh, that you're in the high 90 percentile of people uh, who don't have uh, fatherly or male figures in their lives who, who probably go to those ju juvenile justice centers. Yeah. And uh, I'm pretty sure that he, some of that, along with me having the opportunity to play for the school, I'm pretty sure I weighed into it. Yeah. Because in high school, were you were you doing really well at um, football I, and basketball? Yeah, I was doing well in, in junior high. This, this was going into high school. Uh -oh. And and so uh, but when, when, I, when I did get to high school, uh, things just kind of took off. My, my, my freshman year, I, I, I rocked and rolled until I broke my ankle. And then after that, transferred to another school called Warren Harding. Yeah. Uh, we went to Warren Harding, uh, had more success my sophomore year, my junior year, and uh, my senior year. I won every you know possible award you can want to win, Mr. Football and uh, USA Today Player of the Year, Parade All-American, and all of those accolades. And, and f for coming from that place, coming from Youngstown, a small town, you know, that was uh, that was a great deal for myself. Yeah. So was it high school where football started to kind of outshine basketball for you? 
Yeah, so I, I always played basketball just because it was just a full, cool, cool, fun thing to do. Yep. Uh, but I, I was your guy who I'm like the, the Dennis Rodman, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm not about to score 30 points. I'm not doing no cool stuff like that. But yeah. you know, I box guys out. I grab rebounds. But I was told, like I, I was a dude who was happy yeah. playing defense. Like I knew yeah. my limitations. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and and so football, football definitely took off when I started to take it serious. And was it in high school? Like, would you say almost? Because so you went into high school on house arrest. I wanted to ask it, yes, on house arrest, yes. And then, and then, was that did that coach act sort of as like a mentor to you? Yeah. So the ninth grade, what happened in ninth grade? I couldn't go to a school because I, I didn't live in the district. Yep. Uh, so the judge uh, told me I had to move to uh, I had to go to a suburban school district because they didn't want me to go to inner city. And from there, uh, it was it, to me it was the best thing to happen to me. Yeah. Uh, a new environment. I was able just to focus on what I was focusing on, which was sports. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the work was a bit tough, but be it since that, you know, I was uh, decent in football. They assisted and helped in, in, yeah. in whatever way they could. But uh, that's when things got serious. Yeah, that's great. And then is that when you noticed, like, sort of, like you'd mentioned before that even though you were doing well in sports, you kind of almost got like your social validation from the street stuff, right? Yes. And like, it, would you say high school is when it started to shift to where like you started to actually feel your self-esteem and that stuff grow from sports? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So a lot of, um, even a lot of stuff to activity, be it from the streets or be it from uh, just my environment, it, 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 it didn't, it dwindled to, for the most part because yeah. I just wasn't there anymore. Yeah. You know, I was at practice, I was at school, you know, I was in a, with a whole different crowd of people. Uh, even though I still carried that um, that bravado uh, onto the field or that bravado onto the basketball court, uh, my my identity had been changing because yeah. now, I'm a, now I'm a good football player in the city. Then you're a good football player in the area. Then you become a great football player in the state. And so it definitely, definitely helped me out. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just fascinated by it, man. I'm fascinated by like the things that, you know, like I said, the things that shift this path for different mm -hmm. people. And I think that when you can kick in and start to get your, your validation or your acceptance or your self-esteem from achieving positive yes. things is a lot of times when life switches. You know what I yes. mean? And I don't know. It's just interesting. Um, so. Where does life lead you then? So all through high school, you're pretty much out of trouble. You're not, you know, not getting arrested. I, yeah, I'm not thinking about trouble at this point. It went from, um, it went from, hey, I can go to a college uh, to play football. My ninth grade year, my tenth grade year was like, okay, I can compete and I'll at least get out the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, my eleventh grade year, uh, I actually go around the country. I'm traveling, going to different camps uh, throughout the country, and I'm seeing more talents who have been ranked higher than me. Yep. And I was like, oh, like these guys aren't that good. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and no offense to them. <laughs> no, that's a great um, feeling. But these guys aren't, like sometimes you can read something on the computer and eat. this is, you know, I always talk about context of time because, you know, people digest and they think that the circumstances have always been this way. Yep. Uh, but when you read from one website that this guy is Mr. Everything, you're like, whoa, this is like, you know, this is a big deal. But, yep. you know, when I started to compete against those guys, I was like, man, I can, like, and it, it shifted from, I can be the best in my area to let me surpass the state. I can be the best in the country. Yeah. Like it just went in one summer and then on my junior year, I had a massive amount of success and then just followed up my senior year. And I said, man, I can go wherever I want to. And it just wasn't a shadow of a doubt, like no shadow of a doubt. Uh, I can remember uh, writing a goat on my sneakers. I was like, on, on, on my cleats, I put the greatest of all time. And yeah. I said, you know, I'm going to prepare like I'm the greatest, practice like I'm the greatest, watch film like I'm the greatest, lift weights like I'm the greatest. Um, I didn't realize that I was attracting this stuff to myself at the time, but everything I did, it was all like, okay, how would the greatest do this? And I would just imagine you had this uh, relentless working uh, individual somewhere in America yeah. who was running sprints and running people over, uh, or even we would be in practice and it's time to, uh, you know, uh, run a goal line drill. You got to drill into somebody. Uh, I would imagine, like, that consumed me. You know, how would the greatest do this? Yeah. And 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 literally, it brought me to a level of success that, that I probably didn't, I probably wouldn't, didn't have that confidence at, you know, at 14 when I first entered high school. But over time, yeah. over those experiences, that thing actually helped me and served me, you know, all the way up to my senior year. That's such a cool exercise. Did that just come to your mind for some reason, the greatest thing? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, an, I like, naturally um, – I think you get into spaces uh, when, when, when you're when you're doing something. I don't care if it's podcasting. I don't care if it's 
branding or clothing or TV or it doesn't matter yeah. uh, where you begin to look at uh, who's around or who's in a space and you don't say forget this person but you're saying like I have to do something better than that because yeah. I want to be known for this yeah. you know what I'm saying like uh, it's important for me to be the best at what I'm doing to the best of my ability in that moment yeah. you know what I'm saying and I think like that um, I don't know where it came from, uh, I, I, but, but, but I obviously think it's for everybody. I think everybody has it. Uh, and I just think, um, I, t I tell you one person who uh, motivated me, uh, and, I, and I watched it when I was a kid, uh, Mike Tyson, yep. uh, he said everybody likes to compete silently, but he said, how about you just go tell that person I, I want to be better than you? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And he said, once you do that, things change because now you have to work. Yeah. Now I have to work. Now you know I'm on your ass. Now I know you're on my ass. And yeah. so it becomes a whole different ball game when we put the cards on the table. And I heard that, and I was just willing to say, okay, I'm going to outwork these dudes. I'm tougher than these dudes. I'm, gonna, I'm going to be more diligent, more persistent. I'm just going to do that. And when that happened, and even still to this day, I still use that mentality, great things come from it. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it gives you a supreme level, and I say supreme level of humble confidence you know what i'm saying like and, and i don't know if that's a um that may be an oxymoron to some people but like um you know i, I think you know what i'm talking about like, i do yeah like I, like like you, you basically look at somebody like you don't even realize how prepared i am for you yeah. you know what i'm saying yeah. and, and, and you're saying that in the back of your head but on the outside surface you calm you easy you you still um but you just humble you know what i'm saying but that, that, that's just that's that's how my mind works so I don't know where it come from as a kid, yeah. but I remember watching that Mike Tyson interview. Uh, a, a, again, a story. Yeah. You, 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 listen and to positive content. Positive content. Yeah. Uh, but it definitely worked in that space uh, to go accomplish what I accomplished in high school. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. And that's why a lot of times I think when people sort of uh, get down on like athletes or certain people, you know, I understand the thin line between confidence and, and arrogance and, and that stuff. But a lot of times you hear athletes say things that are like, of course you're talking that way, right? Like, you're not arrogant. You have to think that you're the best in the world. At the, like, you have to. Amazing. You're going out and battling six foot five, 250 pounds. You know what I mean? Like, you yeah. have to think that way. And a lot of times we get down on them. And, and I think that there's something a little different about sort of championing the right mentality. You know, like, we definitely don't want to want to celebrate arrogance. But I think that, like, championing that confidence is a good thing. And we don't always do that. I, I, I think it's... Follow me on this one. I yeah. think it's not acceptable when they take that mentality into society and it can be deemed as arrogance amongst people like I'm better than. Agreed. Right? Agreed. You know what I'm saying? But in the arena of sports. Absolutely. I don't think people realize, like, like put it how it is. This isn't just normal shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's a whole lot of people out here chasing dreams. There's a whole lot of people out here doing stuff. You have to be halfway crazy to accomplish something of significance. Yeah. Period. I've told myself, anybody who's building a business, anybody who's chasing something as an athlete, unless you are prepared to like go halfway crazy, like or until you go halfway crazy, you're really not pursuing it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Until you like, like until I'm I'm talking about days where you lose track of time, days where you don't know Monday from Sunday. You so immersed into the process of what you're doing. You're so immersed into the details. Everything matters. All thoughts matter. All meetings matter. All 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 everything matters. You're not there yet. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's a uh, it's a mission uh, because like success calls for that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it, it it really calls for that. And so when you're speaking about an athlete. Like, this, what I'm going to attain or what I'm trying to attain demands all of this. And when you invest that much, there's an attitude that's obviously birthed from it. It's like it's like planting certain seeds into the ground. Certain plants come from it just because it, that, that's what it is. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And based upon where I'm trying to go as an athlete and who I'm trying to become, I have to be all of this in order to perform well. Now, to have the skill to turn it off, uh, that's one thing. But then also... I think that the the person viewing has some ownership as well. Are you jealous or envious yeah. of this person's success? Or does this person's success highlight your failures inside of you? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or, or are you expressing yourself differently? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
And and I can say that to the point where I've had more success in my life when I've become totally comfortable with watching other people have success. And I know that sounds corny and cliche, yeah, no, but true. when I cleanse myself and it just doesn't bother me if a person has a hundred billion or a hundred dollars, like you're still the same person to me and I'm happy for you, whatever you're doing, like that brought us a total different level of cleanliness to me, if that makes any sense. But yeah. I, I, I told you, I get off track easy. No, I love it. I love it. We're hitting. That's, your off track is my perfect on track. You yeah. know what I mean? So you're, you're hitting it perfect. Um, I agree 100%. So then that's when you chose um, OU? Did you oh, Ohio choose? State, yeah. Ohio State, sorry. Yes. Ohio State was your first choice. Um, no, initially I was going to go to um, two plays. I wanted to go yeah. to Notre Dame. Um, and, and literally I didn't think at the time, even then with having all the success, I didn't really believe that, uh, the NFL was even possible. Yeah. I was like, okay. Uh, and, and I grew up in the area, we both from Ohio, yeah. you know, at, at that time, I don't know the major industry in Akron, but probably Goodyear or, Goodyear, yeah. or yeah. So it, it, where I'm from, if you went to General Motors and got a great job, that was like, you've made it. You yep. know what I'm saying? Yep. And so I don't know if that was the, the good year was the Akron version of that. Or yeah, whatever man. major yeah. industry. You know I remember when I moved to LA, like I was famous just for moving to LA. You like just for if you move to LA and you successfully live here for one year, <laughs> you're a celebrity. You made it. You know what I'm saying? It's literally like I went home for the first Christmas and it was like, so how's Paris Hilton? Yeah. And I was like, I don't know. That's not how it works there. You know, you don't just all get in a room together and become famous. But no, yeah, yeah. it's a hundred percent like not even in the I always, just to sidetrack a little bit, I always tell people, because I'm fascinated by it now, but when I left Ohio, my dream was to work, or was to live in a studio apartment in the Valley, and to work at a skate shop, and be able to just skateboard all day, work at a skate shop, and that was my dream. That, like, was, that it. was it. You know what I mean? <laughs> gotcha. and, and I think that, you know, I, I equate a lot of my success to, like, my my pursuit of constantly learning and trying to do something better every day, right? Which was a gift and a curse to a degree. Cause now after all that I have done, I still feel like I've done nothing, but, um, it was that constantly moving forward and constantly trying to break through new barriers and constantly trying mm -hmm. to get better that led me here. But the point is my vision only allowed me to see that far. Yes. Because the idea of just living in LA and skateboarding all day was a dream was come it. true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so why, why Notre Dame? Uh, literally, I just, I remember watching Rudy and I think that, uh, I think everybody at that time in the nineties, you know, Notre Dame was a big deal. Yep. And I think like, if I said, if I have an education from Notre Dame, I can get a job somewhere. Yeah. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Uh, but it was like, let me go play football for Notre Dame, get an education from Notre Dame. And like, I'll be great for the rest of my life. I, I, I literally thought that was all, I, I thought that's all life had to offer. Yeah. Like you, even saying it right that's now, amazing. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing that even though, like, in, in one hand, you would go watch, like, the best college athletes in the world or best high school and be like, man, I could crush that guy. But yeah. on the other hand, you're like, but I'm still going to probably get a job. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? It didn't allow you to, like, go that yeah, far. But, you, but you, like, when I look at it now, like, from an academia standpoint or, or from a professional football standpoint, i never seen somebody make it. So that's one big thing. Yeah. Like, for a kid to see somebody actually make it and what it looks like in the process of that, you've never seen it. Yep. And then from an academia standpoint, i never seen nobody make it. So, like, to get a college degree from Notre Dame would be like, oh, you know, I've made it and something good will happen after that. And, yeah. of course, that's not how it played out. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Man, how interesting. So, um, what happened? How did you end up at Ohio State? Yeah, so Jim Trussell, you know, obviously he was the coach at Youngstown State for, for plenty of years. And uh, he was obviously the hometown hero in Youngstown. Yeah. Uh, I ended up um, finding out that he went down to Ohio State. Um, and the next thing I know, I just called him. I said, hey, man, I'm coming down to Ohio State. And uh, I went down there. And it, there, there was, it was two things. One, there was a sense of pride also. Yep. Uh, being like, you know, you get, a, you get a chance to play for your home state and not, you know, move to Indiana to play football. Yep. And uh, two, to, to uh, connect with him, be it that he had uh, so much influence in the Youngstown area and growing up and seeing him in all the championships that he had won. Uh, I thought that that was a cool deal. So, yeah. you know, those are those are legitimately the only two reasons. I'm pretty sure when you talk to kids now, like, they don't go to football. They don't go to schools because of the coach. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah. from Youngstown. Like, it, it, academia is supposed to mean something. You know what yeah. I mean? So there's a lot of other factors. So, yeah. uh, that, but that was my reason at that time. Got it. And then how did that go? Like, how did that transition go? 
you you moved out yeah. of Columbus. Like, was that a shock? Like, kind of run me through that. Yeah, so I graduated. I was the first guy to graduate mid-year. So I, for, I graduated uh, in December of 2001. Got it. And went to school in January 2002. And uh, I got down there and... Um, you know, just like any other college kid, you know, the campus seems like extra large. You know, you don't know anybody. You're just trying to figure out, you know, how do you get to, you know, building A, building B or building C, yeah. uh, going through all that. And like the best time of the day was when we, when we had a chance to go to practice after all the schooling was done. And so I'm just, you know, going through the regular uh, college routine like every other kid. Uh, but I'm working my tail off. And just like uh, I was in high school. I got to college, and just like it was when high school, I said, man, these guys aren't as good as I thought that they were. These yeah. guys are just older, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I got to them, and I was like, man, these dudes ain't, you know, they're, they're not who they are. So, um, and, and this is for anybody, just not necessarily with football. I, I've never been a guy to uh, sort of complain about the opportunities not given to me, right? Yep. Uh, I'll just take whatever opportunity is given to me, and I'll work my ass off in that area, and you'll notice me. So, in football – excuse me, football, all the special teams, everybody considers that like grunt work, right? Yeah. So I said, if I go on special teams and I just start knocking people around or making an impact on special teams, like a coach has to notice that. And so I did that. And uh, also the scout team, the scout team is sort of like the team that, you know, obviously has to play against the first team. It's like the scrub squad, basically. And uh, I was like, okay, if I can go out here and run with these guys uh, who who are not a great offensive line or a great uh, assemblance of uh, our best players, uh, you know, and, and if I do good with these guys, you know, the coaches will notice me. And believe it or not, man, that's what happened. I went out there and was grinding with those guys. And over the period of all that time in the, in the off season, and that's no different than a person if you're just trying to accelerate in a company. Uh, I say it all the time. If you're trying to accelerate anywhere, just take more responsibility. Yeah. Be a great steward of those responsibilities. Handle that stuff with efficiency and, and being effective, and you'll grow anywhere that you want to grow. And that's how I went from fourth to uh, first in, in a matter of a few months. It's so true. I think a, a problem that I see reoccurring over and over in, in people trying to kind of move up any ladder is, like, they expect to say, like, give me the salary or give me the position and I'll fill it. As yeah. opposed to, like, mm-hmm. let me fill it and then get the salary or get mm-hmm. the position. You know, and I think that, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think operating oh, yeah. your life that way. Uh, there's a big difference between the people who operate their life where they act and then get the recognition or the paycheck or the position, and the people who ask for it first, they usually end up sitting around asking for it for their whole lives. But I mean, that, that, that comes from a spirit of entitlement. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you, when you work, it, it'll be like this. Everybody in the company knows, it, it, everybody knows somebody. I, I can walk out here and I can spend a day in here. Yep. Or I, I'll spend a week in here, and you know if it wasn't for somebody or these few people, this thing wouldn't run the same way. Absolutely. Or you understand who affects who or who. Or, or who's who's moving things. Yep. And for the leader of whatever that is, that person will appropriately compensate them because they'll say in the back of my mind, like, if this piece moves. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then, yeah, that's if so true. If this piece moves, like, there's a lot of stuff that's just going to go wrong in the time and hiring somebody else and training them and bringing them into a culture. It's just a lot less expensive to pay them than just do. But, yeah. but it, on top of that, it's the right thing to do because they've earned uh, what it is that you're giving them. Yeah, but of course, yeah, it's just how life works. It's like you make yourself irreplaceable and you'll get compensated. Yes. But to say, like, <laughs> trust me, compensate me, and then I'll be irreplaceable, it just never works. <laughs> it don't you know? work like that. Um, so, th- so then, so what happens? Like, you, was that freshman year then? You. Yeah, so freshman year, this is when everything happens. And, uh, and I know you don't know a large part. This is the good part. You don't know a large part of the story. Yeah. Uh, so I go in freshman year. Uh, I go out and I'm able to start now. I'm starting the first time. A freshman has ever started at running back at Ohio State in Ohio State history, which was a big deal at the time. Yeah. And so I go out here, and in my first game, I, I run for 175 yards. Jesus. And so I'm basically just picking up in college where I left off in high school, which was like a big deal. Uh, and after that time, after the game, rather, you know, we go out, we we, we talk to reporters, we talk to kids, we talk to fans. Uh Everybody comes in, uh, you know. Hey, let's you know, let's go out, let's celebrate, let's have a good time. Uh, we go out to a um, a, a local club. I remember uh, Fabulous was doing a concert there. We go out to the club. This one, Fabulous, he was brand new at the Huge, time. You know, yeah. yeah, this yeah. is new. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we go out to a, a local club. You know, you got liquor, you got champagne, you got all this stuff everywhere. 
And the next thing you know, we're in a full-fledged party. And I always say this in context. You know, prior to that, wasn't drinking, wasn't drugging, wasn't you know that just wasn't my deal. Yeah. Uh, but when I when I when I when I quote unquote made it as a local celebrity, uh, remember this. And, and you're a few years younger than me, but I grew up in the MTV Cribs era. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Where if uh, if you were a celebrity, you know you had to have some uh, you had to have uh, Chris style, or you had to Absolutely. have a thousand women, and you had to ha- you, you had to you had to act like a celebrity. So I felt. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people throughout the city that they feel like when, when I become a celebrity, I have to do this. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? But yep. I want to tell them, yep. <laughs> like, you don't have to do that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Even though you may have an option to do that, and even though you may do it occasionally, you don't have to party uh, because you never know where that where that thing may lead. But that, that was the initial deal. Yep. And from there, you know, week two, week three, week four, week five, I'm just having more success, you know, you know, 175 yards, 140, 150, 248, and uh, so on and so forth. And I'm just having a bunch of success fast. Yep. And uh, this one was a big deal. And I always talk about this, you know, you see your face on a magazine or, you know, people following you at home and you just have so much, um, how do you want to say, you, have, you, just have, you, you have so much of an interest in you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yep. when you're 18, that's um, that's a tough deal. Not like this. It, it's a tough deal to discern what you should and should be doing. Yep. Uh, but you just don't have the skill, you know, to navigate, you know, this is good for me. That's bad for me. This is just a bunch of uh, continuous events, continuous successes happening in your life. And so, um, you know, we get through the season and I don't know if I'm brushing too much. No, but no, we, this we, is great. Yeah, we get through the season and now we're eligible, eligible to play the national championship. Yeah. So we go out to Arizona. Uh, we play Miami in the national championship and we beat Miami and uh, life just took a whole different turn. You know, you you're, you're just think about this. You're thir- I mean, you know, 13, you're 18 years old. Yeah. You go through high school. You win every possible uh, award you can win from a personal standpoint. And we got stopped one game before the state championship. Then you fast forward 13 months from there. And I'll just consider this all without compensation because you can't be compensated. Yeah. But the celebrity part, you can experience all of that. Yeah. So 13 months later, everything that every college player would want to do, I was able to do. Yeah. You know, you're the uh, you're the freshman of the year. You're the leading rusher. You won a national championship. You scored a winning touchdown. All of the stuff that you can want to experience, you got to experience in a 13 month period. Yeah. And then uh, this part hits you right here. So then this is the time that um, LeBron's a year younger than me. So now LeBron is coming up. Um, we had already been establishing who he was. But now his senior year is coming around, and and at this time, this is when they're traveling and moving uh, around to play a senior year of basketball. And yep. this is when he's selling out Youngstown State and Akron and, and, and the local universities because he couldn't be a um, he couldn't fit everybody into the high school gym. And so I'm around for this entire period. And me and LeBron have been cool probably since like the, the 10th, 11th grade, somewhere 11 to I don't know somewhere within the high school core point. Yeah, uh, we intersected, but I remember. Um, just being around at time. So to compound your own success, to watch his success yeah. and to watch how massive it was. This is when Reebok and Nike and uh, Reebok, Nike and who else? Uh, Adidas at that time, they were chasing him around. I remember yeah. like funny, the King James shirts with the Adidas signs on them. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You know what's funny is I remember because I'm from Akron, like, and my dad, funny story, my dad shot, my dad's a photographer okay. and has a photography studio in Akron and he, um, not only photographed LeBron's firstborn child uh, with Savannah, but also he um, he photographed all of his uh, sports photos at St. Vee. Wow. And so my dad would always tell me, like, <laughs> hey, historic moments. Yes, and like he really, like if you go into my dad's studio in Akron, Ohio, it's uh, the big picture is LeBron and Savannah and their firstborn child in this like super cheesy like you know photography <laughs> you know like, whatever and I was like holy cow now but at the time my dad would always be like hey um, there's this kid LeBron who's so good you should really come to his games and I grew up skateboarding and so skateboarders like, it didn't connect no I didn't connect and I'm like dad I don't care like what's some good high school player like what do I care and he's like trust me man you should come and then he's like LeBron's at the studio today getting his photos taken you should come in and meet him and I'm like dad like Come on, like I just thought, like yeah. good, you know. And then I remember when uh, you would see his mom. You remember his mom had that famous, like the Hummer. Yeah, the Hummer, right? yeah. And so you'd see the Hummer driving around town, and I'd be like, "Oh man, I think I, I think I'm, I think he's really oh, on to yeah, something." Yeah, you know I mean? like it's a little bit different than just a good high school player, yeah, but a lot different. But yeah, that's what I remember from that phase is always seeing that Hummer driving around and being yeah. like, "Oh boy, this guy's about to just." 
and then he was on the Sports Illustrated cover. And, uh, so, yeah. so, so I remember that phase. Very so that vividly. that so th so take that phase, uh, t take my own phase, yeah. and take that phase starting when everybody saw and to be a passenger in that uh, in that phase, yep. like going to college just wasn't cool. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't even think about that. No, this I'm talking about this is like this is uh and just to put even more into context, like I just I just look back at this stuff. This is when fifty cent had just come out and, and you know, we were able to go on a couple of dates with fifty cent and this is when he's showing us the twenty one questions video. This is when in the club just comes out. Yeah. This you feel where I'm coming from? Yeah. This is like whole different this, this is a is, different universe. Th this is a different universe. This is I think Rock the Mike was that summer. We running around with Snoop and all this other stuff. And it was just uh it was just totally crazy for me. But what actually happened was that the NCAA came in and they said, Hey, you know, we have to investigate you and to make a long story short, they end up suspending me for accepting illegal benefits and, and some of everything else. Yep. And so at that time in my life, um, and I always, always state it this way, when it came to uh, football and getting better in football, or, or if something wasn't going right in terms of football, mm -hmm. I can lift weights, I can get better, I can practice, I can sprint, I can condition myself. Yep. But when it came up just being like stressed out with life, and like, oh, like my career is gone, or, or my career is gone. You yeah. know, I'm suspended indefinitely. Um, excuse me, I can't go to school because academically, you know, my education probably stopped in the ninth grade. Yeah. You know, I probably got, I got, I've been pushed through school probably since the tenth grade. Yeah. At that point, and um, all of these things, uh, from a personal standpoint, I had no idea how to, uh, how to deal with all that stuff. Just kind of was placed on my shoulders. Yeah. So you fast forward that. Uh, what I saw as the only, um, I don't want to call it, I don't know, I, I would phrase it like this. The only thing that occupied myself yep. was the going out and the party. Yep. This is what feels good. You know what I'm saying? Yep. This is the alternative to school. This is the alternative to football. This is the alternative to me not feeling bad. Let me go out. Let me party. Let me have a good time. And let me let that thing roll. And so uh, the next thing you know, we're, we're out here. We're rocking and rolling. I'm partying. And so instead of partying after the game on, uh, on on Saturday, you know, after the game, I'm partying Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, yeah. Sunday. Yeah. So one day I'm out in, um, what is it called? I'm out here in uh, in Vegas at the House of Blues. Yeah. And uh, uh, we get done partying, and out of all people who were there, it was uh, Jim Brown was there. And I had known Jim Brown for years. Uh, but Jim Brown was like, man, you're not doing well. Uh, I can see it. I can see when, when you first got suspended, I can see you now. Yeah. Like, you're partying too much. You're on the scene, like. No, not like there was a physical ailment, but my man, like you're doing too much right yeah, now. Yeah. And uh, he was like, "Won't you come to LA?" Because he was like, at this time, LA had an Ameri Khan program, mm -hmm. and Ameri Khan was uh, this program where he helped uh, guys who were re-entering society transition and, and and provide mentorship and, and just basically positive male mentorship. Yeah. And so I came to LA. This was you know 2002 or 2003, you know 2003 or four, whatever it was, early 2004. Yeah. Uh, and I came out here um, and. Literally, Jim Brown was in the Carolinas for whatever reason, and uh, he said he'll be back in a couple of weeks, but I hooked up with a buddy who lived in the Valley, and uh, I was like, man, you know, let's go out. You know, let's go out and have a good time before, like, basically, Jim Brown puts me on lockdown. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because uh, I already know what it's about to be. I know what type of program. He, like, super strict, diligent, and uh, it, it all, all comes from a place of love yeah. you know, with, with him. And um, But I got down here. I got the sunset. Man, I went out and I was like, man, you know, this is a different place. A whole different place. Yeah. A whole different place. And I said, okay, so you can party, you can get high, you can you can enjoy yourself Monday through Sunday. Nobody says nothing. Yep. Nobody said like that. That was around the time uh, Jamie Foxx made Collateral. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh man, yeah, yeah. It's an easy place to entertain your your demons. You yes, know I mean? <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. Yep. So then, um, what happened? Did you make it to the Jim Brown thing? No, no, so um, Jim Brown came calling a couple of weeks after that, and I just avoided his calls. Got it. And so I just got caught up into the life of L.A., and uh, while I was out here, just, uh, you know, I would party Monday through Sunday. I would, like, I could probably tell you every crack and crevice around this place, you yeah. know what I'm saying? But yeah. I explored all of Hollywood, all of, you know, the valley, all of every beach you can probably consume around here. And, you know, I was supposed to be out of football for two years getting prepared to come back to the NFL. Yeah. But, you know, I'm in Hollywood partying every day. And uh, and, and it, it's two different things. You know, there's an element to L.A. that um, if you're from Ohio and you're working and you're hustling and you say my whole deal is to be successful, there's an element, excuse me, there's an element where you can come out here, you can get caught up. And just like a lot of people, 
from the outside looking in, you could pretend that you're living not like you are. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're talking about like the fake it till you make it type thing? Yeah, you can have but, all the fixings. But maybe never make it? You can have, you can have all the fixings. <laughs> yeah. You can have the, uh, the the lease cars. You can have the rented cars. You can have the lease house. Uh, you can have the the persona, uh, but you're not but you're not actually doing it. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And the problem is here that works as sort of like social currency, right? Yes. Like nobody's checking the validation. Nobody's no. checking the whose name is on the pink slip. You know, no. like there you can you can be the king, uh, and it gets by. No, so I mean just just for, for me, my my guy was somebody. He's he, you know he was a uh, mixed and moving and he was the one who got me access to everything and so what i believe happened myself and so oftentimes it's hard for me to even i think this may be the first time i'm having this conversation because unless you've been in la you don't know yeah you know what i'm saying yeah. so you, you're moving around and you're moving around as if you're a celebrity you know and and he has this and he, he's a he's a uh, jewish guy huge businessman he he actually has the money you know yeah, what i'm saying yeah i don't have it but yeah. i'm living as if i'm having it because i'm 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 i'm, I'm to a degree i'm in his life yeah you know what i'm saying yeah, it's so true man. and 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 uh it, it put it like this it's like the girlfriend who who's with the guy who has the money but then the guy leaves and she doesn't realize that he was she was facilitating his yeah. lifestyle you yeah. know what i'm saying yeah and and literally when you look back on it um, but but you, but then what happens is you get a false sense of security as if you made it. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Because you're like, okay, well, we in Rolls Royces all day and Bentleys. We have beach houses. You have bars. You have clubs. You you know you're living it up. You're having a good time, and this is true. What's happening every day? But you're not the facilitator of this. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And it's so, a false sense of accomplishment, man. And I think that what's extra crazy for you is like. People do that every day. I mean, I could literally name you ten names, um, <laughs> <laughs> like that are currently killing it right now yeah. in, in the fake game. But, uh, but, um, but I'm saying a lot of people do it out here without actually having achieved anything. You had achieved a lot, and I'm sure, like you know, people are probably recognizing you and stuff like that. Yeah. Like you know, you're you're friends with all these people. You've been traveling with rappers and hanging out with Fifty Cent, and, and like so at least. You just didn't have the financial element, I didn't, right? I, I didn't. It played this, had I had the financial element of it, it played this, I wasn't able to get drafted to even get the finance, the finances yeah. to make it happen. Um, and so on a personal thing, I won't down myself. I had accomplished something at a high level. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I just happened to get suspended from doing all the foolishness outside of that. Uh, but that that was the, that, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. I just didn't have the, the money to facilitate. Yeah, so when um, somebody fills that in for you. Yeah. It's like, oh, shit. So all I'm saying is I can understand. I understand how it happens to somebody who's done nothing out here because yes. you can do it. It is accessible. Building a couple key relationships, you can look like you're super rich and super everyone will believe it out here. Like, you know, maybe rich. in another state, like <laughs> or another city, somebody might be like, yo, man, like, why are you driving around Tom's car? Yeah. Out here, they're like, yo, you want a table and bottles? Like, you must <laughs> be rich. Uh, and so I could see, <laughs> I could see how for somebody who had on top of that actually accomplished a lot, that's just a recipe for uh, the sidetrack of, you know. But, but I'd say like this, e even to the, even to the stuff that was happening, here we go. You would have to be uh, to to live how this guy lives. Like you would have to be a, a super successful yep. basketball, baseball. I, I would say baseball player. Like like I, until you get out here and you start to realize the levels of life. Yep. Like like this. When, when I got out here, when I started running around in different circles, I was running around. This was the first time I was like, man, athletes they okay, but there's some guys out here who really are mm -hmm. getting it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Some guys who who really have massive amounts of wealth, and you start, you know. You know, being with Joe Blow or being with such and such, you start to look behind the curtain, and you're like, man, these guys who like are really like doing it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I was able to see that. And so even when I say that, like, even the money I would have had as an athlete, that money would have got swallowed up. And just these yeah. guys, like when you like when you when you're seeing people expenses on a monthly basis, when you're seeing guys seventy, eighty thousand dollars at katanas in a month, like yeah. you know what I'm saying? This is just sushi. You yeah. feel coming from yeah. Yeah. like we start to see dudes are like living on a totally different level yeah. when you know guys go this is real story. Let me grab three Rolls Royces. You know, this is like this isn't like fantasy land. This is an M T V crib. This is like something that's really taking place and he's not the only guy that's like wealthy. All of these guys have something. Yeah. Like it's a total different ball game. And so um but like even I'm 34 now, like that's impressive at 34. But to a 20 year old kid when I was out here, 
you're like, yo, I don't oh, need to yeah. focus on training. You know, I'm, I've am i made it. Everything everything that I thought I would have wanted, I'm experiencing it now. So before going to the pros, it took that motivation away or that hunger away because you felt like I've made it. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And so that, that that's to like, I couldn't explain it any other way than that to yeah. somebody in L.A. from L.A. Like you're from Ohio, but you've been here long enough to know what I'm talking about. Yep. And that's a, that's a tough thing for anybody to understand if they haven't been out here. Yeah, I get it. I get it. And I think, to be honest, on some level, our listeners can relate to it probably anywhere now because a similar thing happens like on social media, right? <laughs> <laughs> Where, oh, yes, you know, does. social media sometimes <laughs> operates by the same rules as LA, LA. <laughs> you know, where you can front pretty hard and yeah. get the clap, you know, get the. Get the respect, or get the likes, or be a be be a some sort of weird pseudo celebrity. So I think that now people in most cities can can relate, relate to what to we're it. saying. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I'm sure there's someone that drives them nuts in their local city. You know? Yeah, but it could, because it's not real. It, but like this, I I'll just for the guy or girl who who's even trying to project that, like you said, that pseudo celebrityism. Like at at the end of the day, you end up with a whole bunch of nothing because at, yep. at at some point. At some point, reality will intersect. It does. <laughs> you know it saying? always does. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? You I, can't I, outrun it. No. I, 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 like this, I, I, I'm, I'm laughing to myself because my girl over there, she knows who I'm thinking about as a person who just chased celebrity. And like, I, I like, I just want to call the guy and say, like, my man, slow down. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, just just slow down. Get Please. your life together. And and, and, and just – but you, but you want to do it from a good place. And so it should have been done for me from a good place. Uh, just slow down and get your bearings up under you and build a life. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, be, be like, and, and I, I don't want this to sound cheesy, but being important is not that important. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or, or being commercially important is not that important. Yeah. Um, it, it, it just is. And like for the most people who are commercially important, that's just for a vehicle for them to monetize that celebrity to somebody. That's all it is, uh, and, and and I don't I know I'm getting off track, but I just like no, I naturally like think about you. Th- you just think about when you come to LA, you, you have to think about the Kardashians and when you get to Hollywood, how they've been able to monetize yep. people believing that they're overly important. You know what yep. I'm saying? Yep. But at the end of the day, these are just people. You know what I'm saying? 100%. And they've just been figured out how to monetize the fact that you believe I'm more important than I am, and I've just created a narrative around that I'm very important, which is ingenious by them and, and what they've done. But like it, being important isn't that important unless you're getting paid to be that important. Yeah. And so they, and I'll say, uh, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. They're, they're an extreme exception to the rule. Extreme. Yeah. yeah, say that, yeah you know, yeah, and say like that. the problem is so like they're an extreme exception, exception to the yeah, rule. Extreme. And, yeah. and now with social media, there are other exceptions to the rule. But the problem is, it's the exception to the rule. It's not, there's nothing to learn from that that you can operate your life by. You know what I'm saying? And that's the problem is when you have someone that you can say, like if a 14 year old, this is what scares me about that and about all these, you know, a lot of these, like some of these, like YouTube celebrities and people that are sort of famous for making a lot of noise and, and making money for making a lot of noise um, and not for any skill set or any, you know, good personality traits um, is like, they think that there's now a model to follow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you think there's some sustainability in yeah. there? Yeah, and there's a 14-year-old, there's a lot of them, in you know Minnesota right now that's saying, well, I'm going to be a Kardashian. <laughs> I don't need to work or need to go to school or need to whatever because I'm going to be a Kardashian. Yeah, and like, oh, you, yeah. have, you have a model to actually base it off of. And that's what's scary, right? And I think like as much as you can, as much as people can learn that that is the exception to the rule, there's nothing to learn from it. Yes. You know, then you can... People can stay out of a lot of trouble because there are a lot of people that are going to derail the same way that you said. This is almost how I see it. The same way that you said when we were younger in Ohio and gang culture blew up, Mm -hmm. everyone either was or acted like they were in a gang because that was now something that was up on this pedestal and you can be that. It's I worry that it's also happening with the Kardashians. Right, it's like oh. now that's on a pedestal. So now a fourteen-year-old, twelve-year-old, whatever, it wants to be famous for being famous, and that's also a dead end road, right? Yes. And so there's these things that we sort of sometimes put on these pedestals for people to shoot for, and they're not necessarily, you know, yeah, it's it, a dead end road. You will have to say this, and and, and to the extreme too, that is like expensively and extremely engineered. Yeah. There's a lot of engineering to make the like just to make 
there, there was a, a dynamic set of circumstances that made that happen. Oh, it's like <laughs> yeah. getting struck by lightning. It's like saying, you know what? I don't need to work because I plan to win the lottery in a few years. Yeah. <laughs> it, it plays, it, 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 and all, all from a, and I said all from a point of like, uh, it, it plays, I wasn't saying that because I don't, I, I, like, sometimes words can be, I don't say that from a point to bash them. It, oh. it, it was all in the built in to just understanding that 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 is celebrity and it's it's not normal or whatever I was going with that. Yeah, yeah, no. And for me, to be honest, just to also say my opinion. Like, I respect them because they took a flash out of nowhere and just blew it out of the Stretched water. It. So you know what? Good for you. You did it. You know, like there yes. was there was a lot of luck, but there was a lot of perseverance and like planning that went yes. into that mm -hmm. career but the point my whole point of it of all of it is there's not one single thing to learn from it for a young person trying to figure out their career that's all i'm saying got you um I, I, anyway. was, I was i was yeah i was but like, i know where i was at in the story yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, for those who are actually trying to listen to the story um I, I was i was i was heading down the road of me going to the nfl can i ask you oh, this sorry go i'm gonna keep you on the story mm -hmm. so when you got uh suspended was that like some bs uh of what sort of i mean you don't got yeah get into it i mean yeah i mean to, just but... it's it's um it, it like just in a nutshell in, in a nutshell it was twofold right it was, it was it was it was really twofold i had basically used some cars so like i didn't get five thousand dollars fifty thousand dollars ten thousand dollars from some you know from some booster who just has a bunch of hundreds in a wallet that didn't happen yeah uh, i have been using cars uh from different dealerships because my transmission had blown inside of my um uh, my cadillac that i was driving at the time yeah and in the process of doing that obviously that was one thing to hang my hat on but then there also was a rift between me and the athletic director and and i don't hold, i don't hold any grudge against him but um me and the athletic director had had a riff and the riff was uh that uh, after we or, or when we were at the national championship, uh, my buddy who I grew up with had basically got killed, and uh, since he had murdered, I asked to go home to the uh, to the actual funeral, yeah. and he agreed initially. But then after time, he was like, you know, hey, you know, you can't go because they didn't want uh, Ohio State in the national championship and their star player to be affiliated with um, a, a murder over a drug deal. Yeah. And so, uh, oftentimes, um, you know, or, or, or when I when I went to media day, I called him a liar. I said, "Hey, he told me I was gonna go home and get the, get a chance to see my guy," and uh, he didn't like that too much. And so, when the investigation came, uh, everybody thought that the NCAA came in on their own. He actually called the NCAA uh -huh. and had the NCAA investigate me. But that's a, that's a whole different story yeah, yeah, and it. a whole different beef. And I, I'm not mad at him because uh, this is a moment of acceptance. I tell myself all the time, had I not done that i would never put myself in a position for him to do that so yep, yep, yep. I, I take responsibility from it no i get it i i just wanted to wrap my head around sort of the context of that and then what was the punishment like you're suspended how long were you suspended for i, I was suspended in, indefinitely and Got it. It, like just think about this at the time i didn't even know what indefinitely meant i was like how long is that <laughs> yeah yeah so three months, six months. Yeah. So, so, so um does that mean that in your head that was the plan like just Take a break from college and prepare for the NFL. Is yeah, so plan? so it, it was legitimately take a break and prepare as if I'm going to get a chance to come back to the team. Got it. And so um, when I came back or tried to come back to the team, uh, the guy said, hey, I need you to show up uh, at 6 in the morning and do punishment rounds for about four months after the suspension. And he just knew the way that my ego was at the time. I said, I'm not about to come in here at 6 in the morning after I'm done with my suspension and just run – uh endlessly for you uh, as a sense of punishment for yeah. me basically it's suspended i said i'm not going to do it yeah. and at that time i was just floating in the wind at that time yeah got it um so then that's when you came out here mm -hmm. right and then that's when whatever so then the so then the plan at that point is to prepare for the nfl yes sir got it so then where did that like i guess take me through like okay so you're in la life you're all around you're seeing all the the trappings of la when does it start to like? When do you start to prepare for the NFL? How's that? Process so I, I, I never really prepared for it because I didn't think the NFL would draft me. Okay. I, I wanted to go, but I didn't realize it was a thing. So the NFL Combine is. Are you familiar with the Combine? Yes. Okay, so the NFL Combine is every February of every year. Yeah. They called me in January and they said, "Would you be prepared to go to the NFL Combine?" At this time, I'm living in the marina and I was living right off the ninety. I was in the water terrace at the time. And so before, I don't know if you're from the area. Yeah, vaguely. Vaguely, right. So I'm, I'm right off the 90. I'm in the water terrace. 
and there was uh, where the Equinox is at now, there was another gym inside the same space. And so I used to go over there, and I wasn't lifting to get prepared for a football season. I was lifting to stay in shape, yep. you know, total different focus. Yep. And so uh, I was like, sure, you know, I'll come over here and um, I'll go ahead and, uh, and train. I'll knock it out. I'll be cool. I'll be ready in a month. And so I go out there uh, to the combine. And at this time, you know, you have, you know, all of these guys lined up. They're in shape. They have been in college campuses and they've been in this collegiate system for, you know, for the last three or four years or however long they were in it. Yeah. And so for me, I was coming straight off the streets. And so in my mind, I'm like, all right, I'm about to get out here and uh, go run and do this 40 yard dash and, 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 and perform very well. I just thought like the adrenaline from the moment would prepare me. Yeah. And so I get out here, I run as fast as I can. And uh, after I'm done, uh, literally it said a 4.8, which is very slow. And so I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, maybe you slip, you know, maybe you didn't run all the way through the line. Maybe something happened uh, throughout the process and so I run again. And after I run again, uh, basically ran slow twice. And after I'm done with that, I'm saying, okay, maybe you go out here and, and, and do some skill drills. You run through some cones and you do the other uh, agile stuff to uh, basically make sure that you um, impress the coaches, even though you didn't run fast. Yeah. And so from there, uh, basically uh, just started to trip over my own feet. Um, dropping footballs coming towards me, stuff that I'm supposed to catch, drills that you should be sharp on, uh, but literally not being able to uh, do this because I haven't prepared for it in the last couple of years. Yeah. I was falling apart. And so uh, midway through the process, I walked off the field because the coach yelling at me, came back to the hotel, uh, got on a plane and uh, came back to L.A. And this was February of 2006. Yeah. No, no, 2005. And so I'm believing that, you know, football for me is over for the most part. Got it. Uh, so then what happened? Yeah, so came back out here. Uh, I remember like it was yesterday, I go to Sunset. The, the first day I come here, I go to Sunset. They're having a party right there off of um, Hollywood and Highland. It was it was right down the street, and we yeah. go into the party. And as we're in the party, I remember sitting here, and I just felt like so disconnected from everybody. You know, music blasting through the air, you know, people everywhere partying, having a nice time. Uh, it was a, it was a, it was supposed to be a good time, but I remember just sitting here like, man, I just don't even feel connected with this place. Yeah. And so I ended up uh, going back down to um, uh, end up going back down to uh, back to the house, and I got on the plane uh, for a couple of days later, and I came back to Ohio. You know, and I was coming back to try to get grounded again. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Because I was like, man, I don't come from this stuff. I don't come from Rolls Royces and Mercedes, and you know, you, you know super. Uh, uh, big, you know, I just don't come from this life, yeah. you know what I'm saying, and, and, and no offense to it, because uh, some people grew up in this stuff, yeah. you know, some people, you know, they don't know anything different, and yeah. uh, uh, I knew my I knew my, my normal uh, at that time in my life was completely different, and so... Uh, Did you go back to Youngstown or Columbus? Came back to Columbus, Got and it. so Ashley, uh, she was finishing up at Ohio State, mm -hmm. I came back to uh, Columbus and, and literally uh, went back to go see Coach Trestle, he was still coaching at Ohio State, yep. And I was asking him, I said, hey, you know, I need to get, I need to figure this thing out. Uh, he told me a lot, but one of the two things he told me was that, hey, I need you to get back in school, and I need you to uh, uh, get in better shape because you 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 were in a lot better shape, you know, when you were here. Yeah. And so the, the the getting in shape thing was a deal. I was able to do that uh, or start to do that, but the uh, the going back to school thing is what really hindered me. You know, I, mean, yeah. I, I couldn't do none of the work uh, up on a college campus. And so maybe after about a month and a half, um, basically I was just out in the streets. I didn't have any money, so it's back to hustling. You know, then hustling leads to robbing, and robbing leads to just the whole life of crime. Yeah, is that in Columbus still? In Columbus, yeah, yeah in Columbus. And so I'm back into the streets doing whatever you know I had to do to basically make some money for myself. Yeah, I ended up uh, going uh, catching a, a robbery case. Or I committed a robbery downtown Columbus. I uh, got caught in a robbery case. Maybe a month after that, I found out that she was pregnant. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm dealing with, you know, you're unemployed, you, you have a criminal case, you're kicked out of college, you're kicked out of the NFL, and, and just a whole bunch of, um, like we talked about that momentum prior to the show, yeah. you know, it was the yeah. negative momentum rolling in my life at that time. And so uh, for the majority of 2006, that was uh, a complete blur because, you know, now you're dealing with a, a child that's about to be born. And so, like, internally, I knew that I wasn't even responsible for myself. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And I didn't even know, like, you know, where do I start to build my own life or where do I start to build um, uh, just a foundation for me? And then you have a, a girl and then now you've wrapped a woman up into your deal. And then you have a daughter getting ready to come in. And that's a whole deal. And then you're 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 dealing with uh, a bunch of um, a failure 
and, and mentally getting over that, that was a complete deal. So uh, it was just a, a, a blur, you know. Um, I mean, and if anybody's ever been depressed, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, I can remember uh, watching those like late night commercials. Hey, if you if you're restless, if you're sleepless, or whatever those commercials yeah. were. I remember when those uh, commercials were first come out. I was like, man, you know, I'm not like who who like who is this? And um, after a while, I can identify with those commercials. I'm like, I feel like all of that. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm saying? yeah. It's funny how that works. And uh, go ahead. Well, no, it's just I just I think that like watching that transition happen, you know, everyone looks at it from the outside first, and then yes. before you know it, you're just that guy, and no uh -huh. one warns you like, hey, you're becoming that guy. You know, like, hey, you got about two months until you're the guy on the commercial. You know what I mean? Like, you oh, just yeah. sort of can float into it and then at that point it's like okay now you're in it now and then the thing about it is getting back out of it alone um is nearly impossible you know what i mean now you're yeah. in this different but i think you hide no but yeah. like this from the outside looking in you're supposed to be a celebrity and and, and this is this is what this, this is reflective but then this is also advice for people going through it mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. You build yourself up to be a celebrity to people. You build yourself up to be popular. You build yourself up to be this person who has so much promise to be rich and famous, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you go through this moment where you're not as hot as you used to be or you're not succeeding in the same capacity or that moment that you had, you didn't stretch it or make the most of it, uh, you become isolated because you become ashamed that even though you accomplished something, this didn't go on as long as you would like it to have been. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, everybody's been there. A major opportunity's come in your life, and you just missed it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You just didn't close the deal like you were supposed to close it. So you isolate yourself because you, won't, you don't want anybody to see you. And the, the, the drug use and the drinking comes from, I need to alter my mood. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So at that point, were you heavy in drugs and drinking? Yeah. I mean, I tell you, Tylenol 4s, Percocets, drinking, smoking, yeah. any, any, put like this, anything to alter my mood at that moment. Uh, literally was doing just yep. just literally just to get out get just to get away from the moment that you're in and um, and and you don't but, but but it goes like this like you don't even realize and, and I would say this for most young black guys like drinking and drugging isn't identified as something abusive like yeah. you don't you don't realize that you've built up a tolerance or a dependence and you've become dependent to a drug you yeah. know what I'm saying yeah because it become me just even in today's language, you know, turn up, have a good time. It's five o'clock somewhere, happy hour. Uh, there, there's all these subtle messaging through society to say, hey, altering your mood is okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, but they don't say it in the context that you know, hell, if you if you're shitty, you know, you probably shouldn't be putting yeah. depressants in your system. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I gotta say that was a, that was a large part of what happened to me. Yeah, you wonder what I noticed that was mind blowing to me is they, you know, because obviously the opioid thing is a big big issue right now um is there's commercials on tv now you know like the drug commercials mm -hmm. there's commercials on tv now for uh constipation from opioids so instead of saying <laughs> hey maybe you should stop abusing opioids and let's figure that part out there's like oh are you constipated from taking too many painkillers here's a drug that will cure that you know, and like that's just mind blowing to me. Speaking of the commercials and the sort of the messages you receive and how you receive them, because yeah. to somebody in that place, it's like, oh, great, there's a cure for this. Like everyone yeah. suffers with this. Thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and like it's just, man, I don't know. It's just it's back to the content thing. It's back to everything. Where like when you're in a certain place, like sure enough, you'll get fed the messages that sort of reinforce that, or yes. you know what I mean, or, or or make that a little easier to go, or like you said, five o'clock somewhere, or this or that, or turn up, mm -hmm. or let's get lit. It all, um, yeah. you know, it all feeds like, <laughs> oh, you know, um, I get it. Is that what led to prison? Yeah. So, no. So uh, August 9th, 2006, that was uh, come down to Columbus, um, driving two, three in the morning, uh, end up making a U-turn. I got off at the wrong exit. I ended up making a U-turn in the middle of the street. Yep. As I make the U-turn in the middle of the street, there was a police officer uh, sitting inside of a parking lot. He comes behind me. Uh, the next thing you know, um, he, he pulls me over. As he pulls me over, he walks up on the car. As he knocks on the window, I pull off. You know, I'm thinking like I want an episode from cops. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, next thing you know, we we on a high-speed chase, rolling down the freeway on 70. And uh, he um, gets behind me. I make a U-turn uh, in the process of doing that. And there was other officers who had gotten to the chase. 
They throw the spike strips out there. Spike strips bust the um, bust the tires. You know, now you, you you're grounded with the, uh, the actual wheel on the freeway. You're yeah. going 60, 70 miles an hour. Uh, from that process, um, I got on the phone. I called my lady. I called my mother. I called the house phone for real. And they both picked up. Yeah. And uh, I was like, man, I just want to get out the car and have a shootout with the police. Uh, not from the, the the point of me wanting to kill them, but like I was just ready to die. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, man, I'm done. Everything uh, that's happening or everything that keeps on going on just keeps on going wrong. And at that point, it was just like a hopeless situation. Yeah. Or I felt in my mind. And I would just say, like, this is like my divine intervention moment because I'm not sure what my mother said to me, you know, what she said to me, Ashley. And uh, and from there, basically everything has stopped. You know, I pulled over to the side of the road. They take me out the car. <clears throat> Excuse me. They um, they basically, you know, take me out the car, put me inside of the paddy wagon. And after I get done with the paddy wagon, I get transferred to um, the county jail. Yeah. You know, I go down to the county jail, and, and maybe after uh, the arraignment the next day, uh, the judge mandated that I get a psychiatric evaluation. It would probably save my life. Um, and I got diagnosed with severe anxiety and uh, severe depression. Yeah. Uh, that was the first time that they gave me uh, some mental health medication to actually helped me to stabilize my mood. Yeah. Uh, during the initial part of my incarceration, I was locked down for the first you know, six or seven months for uh, in, in a 23-hour sort of lockdown type of way. You had 20 minutes to... Um, uh, 20 minutes to go shower, another 20 minutes to um, uh, exercise, and another 20 minutes to use the phone. So, you know, it was just an hour outside of your cell. There was a tremendous amount of uh, isolation. Yeah. And uh, and I don't care um, who you are. When you begin to be isolated that much, and the fact that uh, I was stabilized medically, I was able just to think, you know, just think like, you know, how the hell you end up in this situation? You know, yeah. how do you go from the NFL uh, to, you know, to college and, and have all of this uh, massive success and all of this um, promise to how, how do you get yourself worked into a situation where you're uh, in, a, in a in a cell basically you know yep. what I'm saying for 23 hours out of the day, and uh, for the love of God I couldn't uh, figure it out and uh, you know I would receive letters and, and and things like that from people and they would uh, be encouraging you would have just so many people who were football fans and people fans uh, they would send letters of letters of encouragement but even then I, I still didn't figure it out. Uh, but I always say one book that helped me to uh, just change the the fundamental way of thinking, or to give um, I, I gotta say gave words to feelings that I had. Yeah. It was a book. It was a small seventy page read by uh, James Allen called As a Man Thinking. Yeah. And uh, when the first when I first read the book, I, I kind of read it just like leafing through the pages. Mm -hmm. And when I went back over and probably read the book, you know, twenty times during that period. Uh, it was the first time that I realized that thoughts were things, yep. and that thoughts manifest themselves until thought is linked with purpose, and so, uh, until thought is linked with purpose, nothing intelligent should ever happen. And when I started reading these uh, words, I was like, "Oh shit! Like this is like interesting. Like I'm understanding that thought as a mechanical function, or the way that you grab information and you can process information, and you can kick information out, uh, or how how it takes form on some level." Mm -hmm. It became clear to me, and so. For so long, if you look at the front part of our conversation, yeah. I grew up and I thought I was a gangster. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So every every level in regards to um, me living as a kid, I thought I was a gangster. Yeah. You know, because that was the mentality of the neighborhood that you had to adapt to survive. And then when I got to high school, I thought I was a high school football player. I thought I was a gangster. You know what I'm saying? And when you think about it, uh, when Mr. Roland got me out of trouble, Mr. Roland never addressed the behavior. Mr. Roland actually... Um, Mr. Rowland only said, hey, you're playing football. You're good at football. Football got, got a trouble behavior, never got addressed. Yep. And so as you fast forward that through high school and through college, uh, when football was taken away, that same kid who got in trouble surfaced in L.A. Yep. And so the, the kid who's very primitive and the kid who's very, you know, let me satisfy my, my, my fleshly desires, let me drink, let me drug, let me have sex, let me do all this stuff, yep. that is the kid in us all. That's like the, uh, you know, like when you're a kid, you just fantasize of, like grander, you know, and, and everything is very uh, physical based. Like you don't even transcend into the spiritual space because everything is real, like low level thinking, you know what I'm saying? Yep. In vain. Everything is vain to yep. a degree. And so that was the book that really fundamentally changed it all. And I had another blessing too, and I'm glad I even got this platform to say it. Yeah. Uh, another guy, I went to prison, I got sentenced to seven and a half years. I go to prison. What was the charge? Uh, carry concealed weapons and robbery. Got it. And so I ended up uh, going to uh, prison, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2006. 
I got sentenced to seven and a half years, and Mr. Uh, Kelaconte, my second day in prison, his father was a, a chief of Sierra Leone for like 15 years or whatever, and uh, he called me down to a central office, and in the process of being a central office, uh, he said, hey, Maurice, um, we talked about a bunch, but he said, my, uh, when I grew up, if somebody got in trouble, we would bring them closer to the village, figure out what's going wrong, repair it, then send them back out. Yeah. He said, in America, when guys get in trouble, you all arrest them and basically just throw them away. Yep. And after that, uh, he said, hey, man, I have a bunch of psychosocial and emotional supportive courses here. Uh, he said, and you could take them. And that's when I was talking about that, the, the misconception of prison, yeah. right? Yeah. So people don't realize that prison has an educational wing. Prison has a, a, a social service wing. Prison has a library. Prison has a different industry within the prison function yeah. that you can go and develop in either to create a new skill, craft, trade, or whatever. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, you, you get shows that just show just one portion or one view uh, of the prison system. And I'm not beating those people up. I'm just saying that's just one. Yeah. That's just a singular focus. And, and just based on ratings, I, w- I would imagine. Absolutely. Um, but what, it, what, what happened was that uh, over those 13 months, uh, I was able uh, to realize that I had ambition and ambition is something that I believe everybody has and understanding on how to put that ambition on a track somewhere other than what you've been tra- traditionally doing it. It was something that I realized that I controlled. And yeah. so I was still like the person like, so the person who comes out here, you see, um, I was telling somebody uh, this week, I said, Hey man, when I see LA now, at 34, I see it different. I don't look at a car and get amazed. I look at the amount of effort and the ability for somebody to say, hey, this is for me, or I have the skills to possess to do the business to acquire these things. You know what yep. I'm saying? Or for, for the guy who I've I seen, uh, I, I just see like major major construction inspires me, right? Yep. And so I think like, who has the balls to say I can do this? Yep. You know, I can, I can go ahead and put uh, I seen they, they throw up a hotel in Beverly Hills. Okay, I can throw up, you know, uh, a million square feet of hotel space and I can do it. I can do it well. And it doesn't intimidate me that I have to put up tens of millions of dollars. That shit inspires me. Yep. You know, and to, to do it with comfort, confidence, and to actually execute it and pull it off. Yep. Like, that inspires me now about people who live in abnormal conditions and not the guy who who basically uh no there's no knock to people who've been given wealth uh-huh. but but to the guys who, are, who who've made something of themselves that that inspires me but to, to to get back on track um that's what i started to do in prison i was like i can be somebody else doing something else right so i go through the whole process of going through these social service class classes and then i started to read and uh, I, I got a catalog called Bargain Books. And yep. Bargain Books was a, a space where you can order books for a third of the price. And people would send me 30 bucks here, 40 bucks here, 100 bucks here, 200 bucks here. And instead of buying commissary, I would just buy books. Yep. And I would go to the commissary and buy legal pads for 79 cents. And I would just start doing reading books, reading, reading and writing, reading and writing, reading and writing, reading and writing. Reading and, writing. and I ordered The Economist and Fortune and Forbes and, and The Wall Street Journal and New York Times. And... The local paper was the vindicator, and I would just read and read and read and read and read. And I said, oh, you can mobilize the stuff once you uh, get released. And so that was sort of like, uh, from a bird's eye view, a lot of my uh, process in prison. If that makes any sense. It makes a whole (laughs) lot of sense, man. That's incredible. And and, and it's amazing, too, not to give like a book review, but like the fact, because I read that book recently, As a Man Think It, then the fact that they can pack in in 70 pages what they, you know, I feel like that book is the perfect book to stumble across if you need to like start to open your mind you know like man it is the perfect like just the the little low hanging fruit yeah (laughs) like like, hey read this and it will open your mind it will will take you to other areas that's so true because nobody's intimidated by the 70 pages like i once again not to preach on reading but i because i was the same way for the longest time like i don't remember ever reading one book when i was in school or any of that it's just not i don't know akron ohio we just didn't worry about it i guess mm-hmm. but um but it was always something that i had trouble doing had trouble focusing but now that i've created the discipline it's been so beneficial and i think mm-hmm. that i mean to see that it made that big of an impact on your Huge. life yes is nuts um can i ask you this question because this came to mind when you were saying that when you were growing up in youngstown you were a gangster Thought I was. Yes, thought you were a gangster. Yes. When you went to uh, high school, when you went to college, you still thought you were a gangster. What do? You, what are you now? What about now? I'm, I'm a human being. That's yeah. it. Nothing more, not less. Just yeah. a human being. I don't. 
I don't categorize myself as a gangster. I don't categorize myself as a football player. I don't categorize myself as uh, I, 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 I do fatherly things <laughs> when I'm a, when I'm an athlete, I do athletic things. Uh, when I'm, um, when I'm doing whatever, I do those things. Uh, but I've been able to distinguish who I am from what I do. And, and so I'm a human being that has character, yep. you know what I'm saying? And so I function from that space. Uh, I don't categorize myself as anything because I just think that um, when you begin to categorize yourself as those things, it, it's just not who you are. Yeah. You know, you're you're just a human being. I don't even know how to explain it because I'm not those things. You know what I mean? But I, I think oftentimes um, you, you can see how it got me in trouble uh, when I started to think, oh, I think I'm a celebrity now. Yeah. And so I'm just acting like I'm a celebrity, even to the things you said earlier about the Kardashians. Oh, I'm a Kardashian, so I have to act like these. I have to. I think that I have to act like these people. You know what I'm saying? Yep. When well, you really don't know why they're doing what they're doing or how that stuff is engineered, it can get you into a whole lot of trouble. Yep. And it's just not consistent with who you are as a human being that thinks, that feels, that operates. And I'm, I'm nothing more than a human being who has responsibility. I've been able to, you know, have, have one child and I have responsibility over that. You know what yep. I'm saying? I have a woman. I have responsibility over that. And I have to stay in tune to those things that, that I think God has given me the ability to produce life. And I think anything that you produce life over, you have a responsibility to it. And so I function more from that space. And, 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 I, and I mean to sound spiritual because I'm trying to move into the space where more stuff is done from a spiritual standpoint than from a fleshly, let me fleshly gratify myself, if that yeah. makes any sense. Sure you know does. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that, that's how I feel at 34. Hopefully at, at 44, I'm deeper into this space where um, I care more. Like I care more about coming to this place today to deliver information that could help somebody yeah. or to just be pure and it's, it's done on a different platform to help somebody. I just I hope to that I care more about that stuff in a deeper way and I'm able to do stuff in a deeper way in 10 years than what I'm doing now. And, and just to talk about how you start in one place, but you don't have to stay in that place and how you can transcend over a period of time. And, and you, and you, and you have different experiences from being in a different place spiritually. Like I don't even think this happened by accident. Yeah, agreed. I think you, you transcend send to different spaces and different options open up, yeah. you know, and, and, and the more you transcend, not like you're higher or lower than somebody, but the more you transcend just to a place of spirituality and less connected with things and, and things become, uh, um, I don't want to say uh, obsolete, but I, I don't know. Yeah, they're like afterthoughts almost. You know, like are, it's like, a, like yes. the, the confetti at the party. You know, it's yes. like, the, you know, oh, oh, they're yeah. nice. At, like and, and it's cool, like, I guess every now and then to sprinkle the confetti, but it's not the, the thing, you know. When you get into a space where you care about, this just popped in my mind. I care about the more, and I, st I still care about style. But I care about the comfort in shoes more than I care about the style. Yeah, level. me too. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, like, that's how you know we're that, getting that, old. That's like, that's like a different space. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't want to say like I didn't care about them, but like I just wanted to go buy these, right? And I was like, man, these things are comfortable. Those are but, hot though. Yeah, you still haven't completely abandoned. No, no, no. no like, those so, are good. so like I'm like on the edge, right? Yeah. So I'm still on the edge where I, like I'm 34, so I'm not old, but I'm just not. I put like this, and, and, and don't get me wrong, right? Do I love nice stuff? Yes. Do I enjoy it? Yes. But me going to get something nice isn't for the vain purpose of impressing somebody. Yep. I'm going to go get it if I like it and I want to enjoy it. Yep. And it, it serves some some sort of purpose in my life, but it's not the main deal with me. Yeah, so if that helps. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I'm trying to put it into words, but I just feel like it's almost, at least how, how I agree with you, but like it's almost like the party is the nice fun little thing that you get to do to celebrate the achievement yes. it's not the achievement yeah, you know oh, and i, I think it. that <laughs> when life switches to the party or the fancy things or the rolls royce or whatever being, being the, the achievement yes then now that's when your life gets completely out of balance right oh yes and i think as long as you can always keep that in mind and it's so hard we have a culture built and obviously there's ego and there's all that stuff involved but then we have a culture built on that being so important you know, and with social media and with all the things that we have today and with whatever, it's like we place so much value on that stuff. I tell you this, though, I, I tell you one thing that's, um, and I, I don't want to say like it's cliche ish, uh -huh. but just having people around you to like really just help you keep perspective. Yeah. 
Oh, it's so important. Like, it, uh, I'm the, how, I'm telling you, had it, if, had it not been for, like, even my daughter, she'd be punking me. You yeah, know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, because, yeah, like, <laughs> like, yo, like, like, you're not as cool as you think. Yeah. You know, uh, just having people who next to you, man, and and people who have access to you, um, who are grounded, uh, who yeah. are grounded. Like, I, I tell you something. This was a, this was a humbling moment for me. Uh, because like, you know, like amongst kids, like uh, social media is like a cool deal. And so we on uh, spring break. So she's on you know two weeks of spring break and we having fun. And I was like, you know, I was just talking about all these things that she's going to experience while she's on spring break. Yeah. And I said, go ahead. You know, I said, enjoy your spring break and post it up and, and, and do that whole deal. And she was like, um, no, I get a story. Uh-huh. So she was in school and her teacher told them to go and talk about a car that they wanted to have or something. Right. Yeah. And our, our a dream car or our, our car for the employment or, or whatever it was. Yeah. Point being that, um, she went out and she said, um, uh, she, she picked a Rolls Royce, like mm. Rolls Royce is a, a car. Yeah. And, uh, the teacher in a, in, in a nutshell told her like, you know, pick another car, like that car isn't for you sort of deal. And I was like, well, I come from a place when I was in L.A. that that car is for a lot of people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's all dependable on, like, it's all your perspective. Like, for a teacher, that would be massively. But I don't want to cut my daughter's dreams off to, like, yep. like it, it, like that can be your everyday car. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. not from a vain point, but if you, like, I just, I know guys who drive around in Rolls Royces every single day. And they treat the, the Rolls Royce like it's a Camry. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like, yep. it's no big deal. Um, and, and so I told her, but then we came out here and, and we were with my guy and obviously he has a few Rolls Royces and I said, Hey, I said, go take your picture. And I said, go show your teacher that people drive these every day. Right. Yeah. And she said, uh, well, I'm not going to do it. Uh, because like, I don't want to, like, she didn't want, like, she said, if I happen to take a picture and it's natural, uh, basically I'll go ahead and take it. Yeah. She said, I'm not going to do this. And basically in, a, in an offensive way or in yeah. a braggadocious way. Yeah. And so the next morning I told uh, Ashley, I was like, man, like the level of awareness that she had when she said that. Yeah. I said, I didn't have that awareness at 11. You know it's so saying? true, man. I didn't have it at 25. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, for it to happen at 11, I was like, for you to have that that situational awareness that like as a person, I don't want to be offensive to somebody. Yeah. And I don't want to demean myself as if I'm a thing person. Yeah. And I said, you got more sense than your dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, 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 but to my point, I'm being around people who are grounded, you know what I'm saying? And so even at 11, my daughter is grounded. And uh, it checked me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It made true, me like, man. okay, maybe you shouldn't be telling your daughter to do stuff like that. <laughs> it's so true. It's just crazy when you really see the, like, I don't know, when you're in the moment, you just don't think. You know, there's the saying that you are the sum of the five people that are closest to you, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that when you're in any given moment, you just think, you have so much more power than that, or you have so much more like um, uniqueness than that, or, or whatever it is, but you don't realize how true those things really are and how much your environment as a child really affected the decisions that you made in your environment, even in college or even through these whole processes, you just don't realize how much they affected your decisions so that there are mm-hmm. people who just see things totally differently. And maybe it's worth exploring some other thoughts and then finding a happy medium, but it's so hard to do. It's incredibly hard to do. Oh, brother, believe you me, it took me years to get to that yeah, place. Yeah, it's so hard. <laughs> like, as you said, look, as you're sitting there, I'm shaking my head like, I know, yeah, I know, yeah. I know. Uh, I want to, I, I don't even have anything to rebuttal on that because yeah, yeah. I get it. I think we you agree. Know? What um, let, me, let me just ask you this. What, what, are you, what are you doing now? What's life look like now? I know you're doing a podcast with Yeah, no, Corey so and John. Um, back in 2015, I start, so... To put context to it, I, I got out and from reading about being an entrepreneur so much, I ended up being an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I got into uh, a few different things. I got into some packaging and some uh, some transportation I was doing for a while. Uh, I was making I was making good money and I probably spoke at you know over three hundred places in the last you know three years. Uh, so I was doing uh, pretty decent for myself um, when when I was doing it. But uh, thing that kind of blessed my life, I went to. Um, I went to uh, an organiz. I went to a. Uh, oh, excuse me. I went to a speaking engagement where they were uh, doing a deal with student athletes. Yeah. So they had brought in like five or six student athlete um, s- circles of people, uh, schools of people, and uh, we got done doing a speaking engagement. And after we were done, we went to the uh, to the side room, and in the process of being in the side room, the gentleman had broken down 
um, a program that he was trying to teach kids, and it was a program that I had learned in prison. Uh -huh. And so it was all about cognitive and behavioral therapy, and it was an activating event, the mind activity, the body reaction, the consequence. It was telling somebody how they should process information and basically how you can predict things before they actually happen. Yeah. It was exercise conditioning this. And when I seen it, I was like, oh, I did this in prison. Like, where did you get this stuff from? Yeah. Like, it was like a big deal of where he had got it from. And he said, you know, I run a behavior health agency. And I was like, what is that? Like, what is a behavior health agency? And I thought so much of who you all see today came from that, came from understanding how to process information, came, how to govern, came from governing myself, came from just basically learning how to control myself and control my thinking. I was like, yo, this is like a real thing. How do I learn that if I'm a listener how do i learn it yeah like how do i learn let's just say me in particular like knowing nothing about that how do i go to explore a, that thing go you, to a therapist go to it. go to a licensed clinician um so I me mean, you can go to a licensed clinician for a basic assessment and say hey you know uh you know i may be going through a b c d e f or g some sort of ailment some sort of behavioral uh condition of some sorts and you can ask for a basic assessment and you can just say, hey, you know, do you, can you mind to engage with a CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, with me? And literally, it teaches you the function of thinking uh, and literally processing of information and takes you through a tremendous amount of exercises. And after going through the stuff, you just become mentally healthier. Okay. And, uh, and oftentimes, I think that when we're, like, when you just, when you see, the, like, the physical body, right, you can see, you okay, you're physically healthy, right? Yeah. But when it comes to mental health, nobody sees thoughts. You know, so that is all internal. Yeah. And just as much as uh, you, you, you just sat here and talked about mental health, though. You didn't even know, realize it. We said the information you consume and how it sets your mood and how you set positive. Like you're literally, literally in the literal form talking about positive, supportive mental health. Yeah. Like literally the, the consumption of information, the consumption of words, the consumption of things you see. That literally is a mental health treatment. You're treating yourself from a mental health standpoint. And so people will get up every day and they'll hit the gym but they'll listen to some craziness, so the body will be in shape, but you're a nut. You know, you don't even, you, you, you know, you're not, you're not even mentally healthy because you're programming yourself uh, differently. But say skateboarding, skateboarding is just like football is spiritual. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so I don't care what you say, uh, exercising in its inception is spiritual because you're in tune, you're going through that motion, you're one with the moment, you're paying attention to your body, you're paying attention to how you breathe, you're paying attention to what comes up, you're paying attention to how you can get in and out of moves. It's the same thing with exercising and working out, but when you add the, the physical component and you stack it with the mental component, you're just in a total different space, and that's how you're in tune with yourself, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so what you just explained was mental health, and and I don't know if you skateboard now, I don't know how you exercise, uh, but literally having those things stacked on top of each other is what puts a human being in, in a position to then go out and, and run your brands or run you as a person, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. And so... Um, when it comes to um, when it came not comes to um, when it came to what I'm doing now, I was like this thing literally changed my life, and I said if mental health assistance was placed in front of more people earlier on, maybe we wouldn't get to these situations. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And mental health and drug abuse directly are tied at the hip. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I'm, I'm stressed out. I need to self medicate. I don't feel good. I need to self medicate. I'm stressed out. I need to self medicate. Okay. It's legal now. Let's get high. Let's do this, okay? And so I'm not bashing anything. Yeah. I'm not saying one thing is right or wrong, but I'm saying get 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 an understanding on why you do what you do yeah. and then make the decision, okay, if that's cool for you, that's how you want to live your life. But when you're unaware of making these decisions or, or doing this stuff, that's when it becomes a problem. So I decided to open a place that uh, is called the Red Zone, and the Red Zone uh, it symbolizes just like in football, uh, in football, the red zone is when something serious is happening. I'm inside the 20. I either have to score a touchdown or kick a field goal because I'm in that zone of my life. Yeah. Or if I'm on defense, I have to stop somebody from, score, from scoring a touchdown or uh, basically kicking a field goal. Yeah. And it's symbolic to me playing football. But the narrative is that if you come through our door, something serious is going on in your life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Either with your mental health or even with your addiction issue. And it's all just basically making therapy and counseling look different. So when counseling got offered up to me, it was an old woman. And literally I was like, man, what the hell is she going to talk to me about? Yeah. What is she like? Know? Like we have yeah. no, like there, there's no intersection. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a gangster. Mm -hmm. um, she's a therapist. Like half of the stuff I'm explaining to her is going to seem so extreme. 
and they've never documented this stuff in school. So for me, when I get a chance to do a bit with people with mental health illnesses, or not mental health illnesses, when I just get to talk about mental health in general, I'm not speaking about a mental illness as if you're like, uh, like we're not talking about like clinically retardation. We're not yeah. talking about the guy who who's deaf, mute, or incapacitated. Yeah. We're just talking about a person who's me, me, not not mentally healthy. We're talking about the person who's experienced an extreme amount of trauma. Prior to this, we were talking about the uh, the walk that just took place in D.C. Yeah. And so, if you're a kid and you're just seeing half your school get their heads blown off or yeah. 10, 15 people, that's a traumatic experience, right? Yeah. That's a traumatic experience categorized one on one. If you're the kid from Chicago, you've just seen 400 murders, 500 murders, 600 murders. This is traumatic experiences that have that have happened to you. So, those things cause kids to see the world differently, yep. to engage differently, to trust differently. This is mental health. So this is done. Uh, so literally, that's what we do. We uh, work with adolescents with mental health in Youngstown and also in Columbus, and we work with adults uh, who have different who who are dual diagnosed with mental health and uh, drug and alcohol addictions. And so. If you listen to the story of my life, I've basically been negatively affected from not addressing my mental health and also allowing myself to self-medicate from so much stuff that literally could have been clinically treated a long time ago. And so yeah. the initial point of contact is saying, hey, my man, look, I know you may think I'm cool. Like, so young dudes think I'm cool because I went to prison. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or young dudes think I'm cool because they, they may like football or something. Yeah. But look, my man, hey. Listen to me. I know what you're going through. I know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, l- let's engage, or let l- let me make this platform to engage. And so, 90% of our staff, I'm picking. So I get mm-hmm. to pick the staff who I know who these kids may want to engage with. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Now we can strategically place them in schools and run community-based services for them. Yeah. Then when it comes to adults, I say, look, man, you ain't got to be ashamed. Like I didn't Tylenol fours, Vicodins, Percocets, all that stuff. I didn't dealt with them. I done drunk so much, I done dealt with them. I done smoked so much, I done dealt with them. So all of these things that you're going through, it's cool. You're going through you bad. You might be going through withdrawals. You might be, you might, you might be, you might have lost your relationships, lost your families, but it's just a moment in your life. Yeah. Like it's it's not the final moment. Like your your final moment isn't spending, you know, day after day just worrying about uh how you're gonna get to an AA or NA meeting or treatment. Like you can go still of a full life, but Please understand you have something that you have to check more than, you know, Joe Blow have to check. You have to keep this in check in your life. And so you can go live a full life and and, and and do everything that you wanted to do. But there has to be, just like we talked about earlier, there has to be an example on the other side. Like sometimes when you see people in, in recovery or going over mental health, they're like they're stuck in this sort of caste system. Like they're just, okay, like they don't just exist anymore. They, they, just, they, just, they just exist in that community. But yeah. I'm here to tell you, man, you can live life, you can have your family, you can be happy. I'm in L.A., I'm not drinking, drugging, partying, nothing. I'm happy. We're about to go to the beach after this. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm going to walk around and eat food off of, uh, from in Santa Monica. You know what I'm yeah, saying? And yeah. go back, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, work out, and be happy. You know what I'm saying? And so that, that that's it, and that's all I do. Uh, we, we service about 800 people. There's about 135 people on staff now. Um, you know, we, we, we're growing into some new different areas in the, over the summer, both in the adolescence and the adult space. Um, and we have a fun, man. You know, we have it's fun. Amazing. We, we have, we have a whole lot of fun. And so in, in podcasting and so podcasting to me is my therapy because I don't know if you know, John's a recovery. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, we got uh, into his story. His story is incredible yeah. too. He's an amazing dude. He, he's an amazing dude. Yeah. And so just being able to, um, to come to a common place and to use technology and to talk about stories and to have a platform to talk about your vulnerabilities. But look at John. Yeah. Successful in his own right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But it, it, it isn't about things, but he's somebody who, who came out of it, who, you know, who, who has become successful. So yeah. um, the podcast, the po- out of all stuff we do, the podcast is the most releasing yeah. things that we do because it's just a place to just let it all out. <laughs> So good, man. I think two things from, from, from what you just said is, number one, I think that the same way we said, like, um, God, what do we say? Like, when you're younger, you sort of, you don't have access. Like, you were saying when you were younger and you're an athlete, and you just assume that you'll never make it because you're in Youngstown, Ohio, and you don't have any example of someone making it, yes. right? And that now, the one of the good things about social media and the internet and that stuff is you can kind of see what you know, you can follow LeBron and see him working out constantly. And you can yes. see these things and be like, okay, this is what it takes. Mm-hmm. Um, this is possible. This is relatable. And that's a really 
cool thing. I think that what you're doing that's so incredible and people like John are doing this so incredible is I think pre-internet, pre-podcasting, pre-relatability on this sort of medium, people assume like if you had a mental health issue or a drug issue or you're an alcoholic, like that's a death sentence. You know yes, what I mean? Like they don't realize that other successful, really happy, sometimes really rich people also mm -hmm. have those problems. And I think that's the work that you guys are doing that's so incredible. It's like mm -hmm. John was so open about that on the podcast and you were just so open about it here. Mm -hmm. And I think that like a kid being able to hear that story and, and, and be like, oh, like you can have both. You know what I mean? Like you can have these issues and still be really happy, still have a family, still be rich. Because you're just, I think that before pre-internet, pre that stuff, like I said, you're in Youngstown, Ohio, maybe dealing with a drug problem. You just assume there is no way you're ever going to be happy, rich, or in Venice Beach eating corn dogs. You know what I'm saying? Like no chance, right? Um, yeah, you're not thinking about that. No chance. It's not for you. And I think it's the difference mentally of saying this is for me and this is something I can attain is a life-changing difference when that clicks in you to say yes. i can attain that right to when you mm -hmm. just don't think that you can and i also think that what's so crazy something i'm a big sort of right now I, I don't do anything to contribute to it so i can only speak so much but i just witness it is i think it's insane the way that if you're a uh, person who gets in a motorcycle accident and you severely damage your leg and your legs, you have surgery, five surgeries, your leg's in a cast for six months, blah, blah, blah. It is understood that that leg is going to be weak. You need a lot of therapy. You need a lot of work on it. It's probably going to take a long time. If you don't, you're going to walk with a limp for the rest of your life, blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to rehab back to normal. If you face an emotional trauma, it could be, like you said, a school shooting. That's obviously incredibly severe. It could be the death of a family member early, mm -hmm. uh, mom or dad fighting, someone going away, blah, blah, blah. That's all emotional trauma. We don't treat that the same. And we don't say, man, that was trauma. You're going to need to sort of rehab from that or work on that or that's something that forever in life might affect you. You need to be aware of it the same way you might your bad leg or your bad arm or whatever. Yes. That, I think, is a huge breakthrough that when we one day get through that point i think it'll be huge because i think the same yes. way that we just talked about like in this whole conversation we talked about being a kid and and not wanting people to question your character right because that's the biggest insult on who you are it's not it's just programming it's wiring it's how you were built up it might be your childhood it might be yes. whatever but people look at that as the ultimate thing because you're questioning who they are as a person the same way that if someone went through a lot of emotional trauma and now they have anxiety depression issues blah 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 that just becomes who you are as a person and that's not fair right because it is sort of the remnants of a traumatic experience the remnants of a traumatic 100 percent. yeah and i just think that's something that when people like you that are working on stuff like this it's so incredible and it's something that i you know hope as i grow and learn more about it it's something i'll maybe angle more of the podcast or do more work in that but i just think that one of the biggest like tragedies of the way that we think about human beings is that the mental side is still looked at as like who you are and not to be talked about or not to be yes. you know addressed or whatever <laughs> and not looked at as something that can be worked on and strengthened and there's a fitness there and there's a you know what i'm saying and it yeah, just leads absolutely. to such a better quality of life you know yeah i mean i, I, I just don't this is just my personal opinion i just believe when we talked about mental health it's always been severe mental retardation yep. are you seeing somebody yeah. they were deaf mute and you just you just categorize that or it, it's no different than if you you watch basketball and you know, uh, if you've only seen people dunk the ball, you know what I'm saying? Yep, yep. You're like, yo, there's more to the game than that. You know what I'm saying? Guys, you know, do more. And that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's crazy. I just think that it's so easy to be labeled as, like, you're a crazy person. Yes. Not, like, you know what I mean? Not, like, whatever. I get it. Um, let me ask you just uh, one big thing that I like to ask, and I think <laughs> you'll have an interesting, like, perspective on this because you've been through so many things, is, like, what is your favorite failure of your entire life? Meaning, you know what I mean, but that one thing that at the time was probably catastrophic, end of the world, very bad, and now looking back on it, maybe shaped or directed a lot of what you do in life. My favorite failure. <sighs> Believe it or not, my favorite failure mm -hmm. was actually getting kicked out of school. Was it high school? No, oh, college. college. college yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The suspension. 
Yeah, because when I look back on it, and I can only look back now as a 34-year-old person, as I look back on it now, it was the first time that I was forced to become self-efficient outside of like some external thing driving my life. And now was I initially successful at it? No. You know, I came out here and in, in, in the process of being in LA, you know, that got to me as a young guy. Um, but when I see other guys who are athletes and who have been a part of the system, uh, the, the college system, the NFL system, even with these guys with money, a lot, a large part are lost. I see a lot of guys who didn't make it in college and they still lost, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, where a system has taken care of them. Mm -hmm. And so the fact, and that sounds crazy because I had enough talent to go make, you know, tens of millions of dollars playing football. Um, The beautiful failure in that is that I failed and I was forced to think the way I think now. And the failure from football brought the, the failure from football brought the failure with alcohol. The failure from alcohol brought the failure with crime, and the crime brought prison. The prison brought the books. The books brought an education, and literally all of the failure put me into a place where I was always learning uh, what it was to get out of that situation to have more independence. And from failing in college and from having an, an external thing be so significant in my success and failures, be it the football system, yeah. I just told myself I will never put myself in a position where somebody has control over me. Yep. I will always put myself in a position where I own my own stuff, I do my own stuff, and nobody will ever be able to tell me, no, you got to leave, you got to get out of here, none of that. And I was like, if you look back on it, had I not got kicked out of school and failed from that experience, I would have, I would have probably been a guy, you know, um, it, it's like the guy who's a musician or the guy who's an actor who's been conditioned or the football player who's always looking for an agent to represent them yeah. or somebody, I need somebody to represent me, to get me a gig, to do something like me. I don't care if nobody calls my phone. I, I, I got the spirit. Like I go make it happen. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that I say that. Yeah. And I just wonder, I almost, you know, not to throw out too much like uh, uh, hypothetical, but like, it's almost like had you continued on that path, because I'm also a believer that kind of like you come to these moments no matter what whether you like it or not you're gonna have to learn everything you learned yes so it's almost like what would the lesson have been if you had continued on and went into the nfl and started to make this money like would the lesson have been much worse you know could it have been something that killed you could it have been something that you know i just yeah, oh because I, I believe that either way you have to learn it man here we go right and you, you can't even engineer this stuff. It feels like I'm fake because I'm in Hollywood, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you go back to a, a a tweet that I sent this morning, it was all about that. It's about a, like you can't avoid you can't avoid the inevitable. Yeah. Or it, it, if you don't deal with that problem now, it will resurface and manifest itself somewhere down the line. Or that same skill set that you either had to produce or engineer, you had to, you were going to have to call on the skill set or develop the skill set at some point along the road, no matter if it was now or no matter if it was later. Yeah. I said that exact same thing, and I believe it wholeheartedly. So yeah. I don't know what it was because one of the hypotheticals don't exist. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. It, it, it could have been based on, like me just taking an educated guess, I'll say this, based upon how I live, it could have ended a lot worse. I could have ruined a lot more friendships. Uh, who knows? I could have uh, just just the way I was living. You look at these guys now; they have ten kids. I have one daughter. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't have miscellaneous kids. I don't have you know homes in fifty areas. I didn't go bankrupt. Uh, you know, I just didn't do all that. I don't have one of those stories. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it, it could have ended up something like that. But my my I, I'm fortunate that I that that happened now. You know, mm-hmm. and and I think through all of that, you have to grow and get through it. But I also say this everywhere I go because I believe in it. I've, I've been able to a chance. I've, I've had a chance to experience it. I think that your blessings and your distractions or adversity weigh the same. Yeah. I believe the more distracting something is, uh, the, the 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 blessing has that equivalent value. Uh, and I think the process of getting through it or figuring it out uh, helps you to get to where you're going or get the blessing but it also builds the skills to sustain whatever it is that you're having. And I think that having the, the, the um, ability to hunker down, so to speak, yeah. and be like, I'm going to get through this shit, I think that is what makes you. I think that's what's bringing everything that's inside of you out. 
and the guys who cheer to like to get away from that. But it's no difference than if you're trying something new or a trick with skating. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know the process of that, but I'm pretty sure the harder shit is like the hardest to figure out. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. And take the most effort and take the most practice and take the most concentration. But that payoff is the most worth it. You know Got, what I mean? Guys respect it when they know how, oh, that's hard. Yeah. I, it, the, people don't do that or, or a series of tricks together. Yep. People don't normally do that. You know what I'm saying? And so even with my life and the circumstances, I get respected now because they say people don't climb out of that. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Or if they climb out of that, they don't take it. To, they don't take it there. You yep. feel I'm coming from? And yep. so, that's the story. You know, that's the my life ain't nothing. That that's the story. But trying to take that story and put it in other people and say, hey, you can climb out of that. You can do that. Um, if that makes any sense. Sometimes I, when no, I talk, it, does. it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Um, okay, last thing. This is my big ender. If you could, all the ups and downs, everything you've been through, all that you've learned, if you could go back, and I always try to pick a moment from your story, if you could go back, let's say, to 11-year-old you, mm -hmm. just getting out of juvenile uh, correction for stealing the car. Uh, so I would argue sort of more off track than ever, right? Not mm -hmm. clear on a path in life, whatever, and, and where, where doing something like that is celebrated. If you could tell yourself anything to sort of take the edge off of the rest of life or, um, you know what I mean, give you a little bit of a, a, a cheat code, what would you tell that version of yourself? What would I tell that version of myself? Um, I would tell a couple of things. One, um, I would try to have a conversation to get the conversation started to what makes up an individual. Yeah. You know, because I think so much of the inner city is on what do I have? I think the lack of not having something puts a pressure on you and to everything is driven off of I have to get something. I have to get a thing to validate myself. I think I would have that conversation. But two, the conversation I would have is that, um, and this is not very popular, but I would say, hey, you know, to the, to the knucklehead running around trying to take his future in his own hands, I would say, hey, look, the, 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 the mentality that you have to go out and get isn't necessarily wrong. Uh, it's entrepreneurial in its inception, right? Uh, I think criminality and entrepreneurship, if you took the, the vehicle and what people go and get, they're, they, they kind of like are tied at the hip. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, somebody going to buy a drug for as cheap as they can to resell it, to reallocate the capital, to deal with relationships, to dealing with consignment, to managing a team to all that stuff uh and at that point when i'm 11 i want things but i want to take my future in my own hands so it will be the conversation about understanding who a kid is like just get it get get the process of how do we get the chance to just tell you who you really are uh and to make that make sense and to get paired with somebody like a mentor and, and, and make that a consistent thing yeah if i can have a wish list i would do that but then also I would say um, this is what it is to be an entrepreneur. And if you want to take your future in your own hands, you want to be super successful, you want something more than your mother provided you, uh, this, these are the mechanics, you know what I'm saying? And um, to the best of my ability, I don't know how you do that then, but now you got, you know, Alibaba where you can buy products yeah. directly from China. Yeah. You know, you have every, you know, place in America or in the world or you can source something uh, and you can logistically put things together and advertise products on different platforms and and, and, and now it's possible. So that that, con uh, that entire conversation can happen today and it can be real and it can be actualized yep. to any kid in America or to any adult in America if you want to make something to yourself. And so those are two things because I'm speaking to my 11-year-old daughter now yep. Yep. and having the conversation as to who she is is a real thing and she probably gets more of that from school than her mother and just seeing me operate but 100 percent, i tell her it, it, i tell her like literally don't think about being employed think about employing others not to say that being employed is a bad thing because you may be in the learning process but think to employ and some of the things that i'm putting in place now is all for me to help help build help build her the skill set to own and to run and to think bigger earlier because I just don't believe that that was uh, my case. No offense to my mother or the people who raised me, but they just didn't know any better based upon their upbringing. So. Yeah.
That was a long answer. That was <laughs> but... perfect. You nailed it. And lastly, read as a man thinketh. Yeah. You might as well start now. <laughs> yeah, read as a man thinketh, yes. Um, there it is, man. I appreciate that. You you killed it. Uh, thank you so much. Where is anywhere where people can find you? Where, where they should go look if they want more? Yeah, I mean, I'm on, um, uh, I, and this is before I knew what branding was. I, I got out of prison and so I got out of prison and started a Twitter page. So yeah. Twitter is Reese Claret, R E E S E Claret, and it has a blue check. But then um, Instagram is a uh, it's just Maurice Claret. I don't have a check on. It. I don't know. I don't know how I got the check on Instagram. Yeah. I, I don't know how I got the check on Twitter, but I know I don't know how you get it on Instagram. Yeah, we got to work. I'll look into that. Yeah, I'll see if we can help that. you with yeah, that. You so, deserve it. <laughs> yeah, so, but it's, it's Maurice Claret on Instagram and Reese Claret on. Um, on uh, uh what is it called on, on twitter yep. and I, I don't i don't know how to do so i i, mean, I, I don't know how to do snapchat yet so yeah I, you know, I wouldn't even worry about it it's, yeah. it's about to die anyway <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. instagram just crushed them oh yeah so i i don't like so so luck luckily you know i, I don't know how to do that but yeah don't worry about that yeah. and then business and biceps you're on that oh man, every... listen to me. yes yes so uh, i feel bad for i feel bad for mentioning late no, no, i got you i got so involved into myself but uh business and biceps business and biceps is uh it was one business of Boston is the reason I'm here uh, for making a connection. But uh, you can find us on iTunes and literally type it in. Enjoy us. We uh, we we go twice a week. You know, we enjoy ourselves and yeah. we have a stockpile of uh, episodes. I recorded a bunch of episodes before I came out here. But it's all like if, if you had any appreciation for how you heard me speak today, we all speak in this line, like this, like this spiritual line and this pure line. Where it's not about things, it's a different. It's it's it's, it's just a it's just a different way of, um, just just straightforward speaking. Not yeah. all like the fantasy land stuff. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, you do. And you know well. what I'm talking about? Yeah, like I, 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 I'm talking to you, but I'm trying like I'm trying to tell the the, the guests like I, I, from the from the questions you ask, ask and knowing you just a little bit, I kind of like got a feeling of who you are. Yeah, yeah, You know yeah. what I'm saying? I, yeah. Like the, the nature of somebody's questions will, will tell you a lot about who they are and what Absolutely. they value and stuff like that. And so if you if you kind of like like that sort of information and you think that you can learn something, please tune in because you have um, just a, a good group of guys just having conversations. Yeah. There it is, man. I can't thank you enough. Uh, stay in touch. Anything we can ever do to help, we're here. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> all right, there it was. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, or even if you didn't, give me a like, give me a comment, give me a subscribe, do all the above. I'll be back next week. Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it as well as vlogs, other web series, and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it. I promise.